Around the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport. The band is incredible. The thrill of victory. Absolutely the best. And the agony of defeat. Look at him go! Oh, baby! This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. For these men, this is a long and dangerous day. What goes through a man's mind? 500 miles, 220 miles an hour, steeply banked turns, and cars maneuvering inches away. They know one thing. The reward is worth it. I'm Paul Page, and since the very first Michigan 500 in 1981, this has been a very special race. There's always something a little unusual, always something spectacular. The fans and racers alike approach this day with some fear, but with great anticipation of a wonderful race. We look for that here today. Consider just in the past few years, the number of lead changes we've seen. And remember, that number 144, those happen at the line. Michael Andretti grabbed a big win last week in Toronto. Last year at Michigan, he barely lost to Juan Montoya, and he's a two-time Michigan winner. This is the one race where starting position isn't nearly as critical as in so many others. That's good news for Michael Andretti and his team. He's back here starting 18th today. Michael, in your mind, the key to finishing 500 miles in the heat at Michigan? Uh, I don't know what the key is. Just keep running all day, take care of your equipment, and uh, stay out of uh, all the trouble. Any concerns for you? Well, not really. I mean, I think everybody here is pretty heads up, and uh, if we all take care of ourselves, uh, you know, we should, uh, we should have a good race. When this man finishes at Michigan, it's usually with good results. He's finished six times. Five of those times, he's been in the top five. Kenny Brack is masterful on ovals. He won back-to-back -back races in Japan and Milwaukee and is the 99 winner of the Indianapolis 500. Today, he wants to avenge last year early exit from Michigan. And by virtue of being the fastest man in practice here at Michigan, Kenny Brack will start today's race from the pole. Now, we mentioned he is a former Indy 500 winner. He won that race driving for A.J. Foyt. And Kenny says, A.J. and my current team owner, Bobby Ray Hall, taught me something important about 500-mile races. In order to win, you have to be patient. Kenny Breck may therefore start conservatively, but boy, is it nice knowing you have the speed if and when you need it. Castro Nevis displayed his oval skills on the biggest racing stage in the world, winning the Indianapolis 500. Today, he looks to win his first part event on an oval. Engine comes to life. Elio, when you won at Indy, is there anything you can take from that win to help you today? Well, Gary, I'm going to try to do exactly what I did at Indy. But if I'm stopped passing people, that means I forgot what I said. So let's go, go as hard as we can. We wish him Godspeed. The engines are roaring to life, as you can hear. In a matter of moments, Team Penske looks for its 23rd 500-mile victory. No other team can make that claim. That giant vacuum behind a car might be the key to today's win. Parker Johnstone sat on the pole here in 1995 and understands the draft as well as anyone. Rules changes for this year have resulted in about a 10-mile-an-hour speed reduction at Michigan. As a byproduct of those aerodynamic changes, the already big draft is even bigger. What does that mean? It means we'll see passing from the front all the way to the back every single lap. If you love side-by-side open-wheel racing, you've come to the right place. Pit strategy was a key in several wins this year. In a 500-mile race, pit strategy is everything. Scott Pruitt, the 95 winner, will track strategies today. 
conditions today, a lot of things are going to come into play. The biggest thing, the relationship between driver and engineer. Everything becomes more critical when it's hot, and it's very hot right now. They're going to work on the cars throughout the race, and that team who gets it right for that last run of the checkered flag is going to be in the best position to win. And here is the starting grid with the teammates, Kenny Breck and Max Pappas on the front row. Pappas suffered a heartbreaking Michigan defeat in 99 when he ran out of fuel in the final corner. The second row, Tora Takagi and Paul Tracy. Row three, Tony Kanan and Michelle Jourdain Jr. Tony capitalized on Pappas' misfortune to win the 99 Michigan 500. In row four, it's Brian Herta and Sinji Nakano. Back in row number five, Christian Fittipaldi and Mauricio Guzelman. The sixth row is Jill DeFerrin and rookie Scott Dixon. In the seventh row, it's Cristiano D'Amata and Alex Zanardi. Zanardi's only 500-mile victory is the 1997 Michigan 500. In row eight, Jimmy Vassar and Mamo Gidley. Vassar won the inaugural U.S. 500 at Michigan in 1996. Row nine, Roberto Moreno, a very lucky man, and Michael Andretti. Row 10, Elio Castro Neves and Adrian Fernandez. In the 11th row, it's Patrick Carpentier and rookie Bruno Junquera. Oriol Serbia and Alex Tagliani make up the 12th row. Tag finished second in Toronto and led five laps here at Michigan last year. And starting all the way in the back alone in the 13th row is the Scotsman, Dario Franchitti. When we come back, the field will be rolling toward the green flag for the Michigan 500, the final round. The Michigan 500, presented by Toyota on ABC Sports, brought to you by FedEx, proud sponsor of the FedEx Championship Series. Welcome back to Michigan. The safety cars have pulled off. We're ready for the running of the Michigan 500 presented by Toyota as the field moving into turn one begins now to form. Two mile oval, 250 laps. And as we said, the draft will be everything. We'll see lots of passing. It'll be interesting to see who wants to take the lead. A lot of cars will try to stay behind conserve tires, conserve energy with the engine and fuel. But you know, racers here will want to go to the front and lead this race. Get a view of some of our onboard cameras here as they move to the very wide back stretch. There's Cristiano D'Amata. You see Zanardi coming up alongside him. Mauricio Guzman, look to the left over there. They have paved the entire area down the back stretch. You can see it clearly from the pole sitter's perspective, Kenny Breck. That's turn three that runs just ahead. There's that wide open expanse. They met with the front row as well as Tora Takagi to try to get at least three car length spacing in between the rows so they don't all find themselves drafting into a big bundle going into turn one. It doesn't look like they've done that yet. Very pretty order. Coming off the final turn, looking for the green flag. Kenny Breck, Max Pappas. Breck brings them down. The front row, Team Ray yellow, Hall yellow, and Letterman. Yellow, yellow, yellow. They wave it off. Back up, we'll do it again, do it again. They wave it off. So now they will have another lap, though, to move around, to find their positions again, and come back to the green flag. You see 93 degrees, it's hot here today. It's very hot down in the pits. This is the concern they have. Look at the split here between the second and third place cars. Tora Takagi comes back down. You can see they were looking for a nice, evenly spaced three car lengths between each of those rows. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Quick update on Jill DeFerrin. There was a report of some smoke off the back of the car. Roger Penske on the radio tells Jill not to worry about it. Apparently just some residue on the turbo. Once she got on the throttle and everything kicked in, it cleared out. So that's not a concern at the moment for the Penske team but just exactly what you don't need to break your concentration as you're rolling to the start. But wait a minute, what's that underneath the car? Is there something going on down there? I thought I saw just a little sparkle under that car. We'll keep an eye on Jill DeFerrin for you. 
This is the spacing that's critical right here. They want to make sure that Kenny gets to the line first, but that those rows are evenly separated. Ready to come back to the green flag, and here we go. The 500 is underway at Michigan. Torres Akagi looks roll, Opapas looks high. Pappas noses ahead. They come three wide off of two. Rex slides into the lead now. Coming off of four. Tony Kanan comes up right behind towards Akagi for third. Moves to the outside. And Pappas takes it at the line. Now Brett comes back to come around Mac Pappas. At the same time, Kanan and Takagi battle. We knew there'd be passing from the front to the back on that opening lap. Dario Franchitti passed four cars moving up from last place. Here comes Mac Pappas. And Pappas solidly has the lead. He'll take it to the line. To the lead. Remember, in the way things are scored, though, it only counts the lead at the line. We're going to keep track of all the other passes for you as well, though. We're looking inside. Clear. Far right of the screen, that's Kanan working on Torres Akagi. Lead separates. Leads at the line again, and here comes Kenny Breck again. There's Michael Andretti. Started 18th, he's already moved up to 10th. Got a great start. This is perhaps the most difficult portion of the race. Right at the beginning, you've got to get into a rhythm, you've got to get settled down. You can't pretend that this is a sprint race right at the beginning. You've got to try to take care of the engine right away. And a lot of these guys, being racers, they can't help but go to the front. This is a very long race. You've got to be conservative right now in order to make 500 miles. Michael Andretti, you saw him get around Sidney Nakano for nine. Cristiano D'Amata, he's falling backwards. 22nd right now, but it looks like he's battling well now with Scott Dixon. Moves inside of Dixon. Back at the front. They continue to swap. 12 unofficial lead changes thus far in just six laps. Parker, though, is this perhaps a, a team strategy to help rest an engine? Well, you would certainly think so, and look how they're starting to pull out a gap here. If the two of them can work together, the draft this year, as we said at the opening of the show, bigger than it's ever been. It's 10, 12, even 15 car lengths, but these two Team Ray Hall teammates are working very well together, trying to break that draft, rest the motor, and try to get good mileage all at the same time. Paul Tracy now coming up to the front. They've all gotten around Tora Takagi, and Tracy is spotted in to battle now for third place with Tony Kanan. Gary Gerald? Paul, well, yesterday, late in the day, we were talking with a couple of the management types with the Ray Hall team. Oh, traffic jam. We're watching him fly by us into turn one, but the strategy that was being broached was can you find a couple of fast guys hook up with them and then maybe four or five cars try to lose the rest of the field thus far i don't think we've seen evidence of another team wanting to play it was strongly suggested to kenny breck that he go see and if he could find a couple of allies much as they do in uh, restrictor cup racing or in winston cup racing with a restrictor plate type of racing and uh, it'll be interesting to see if that scenario plays out right now the two teammates just keep swapping it back and forth doing that. Michael Andretti is coming up through the field. He's now side by side with Takagi. There comes Michael. Michael just off the edge of your screen. That's Brian Herter right there ahead of Michelle Jordan Jr. And you think what the strategy might be is to get back in a line of four or five cars, be able to breathe the throttle, rest the engine, conserve some fuel. The Team Ray Hall teammates, however, have an advantage at the front because if there's any sort of incident, mid-pack or back, you're not going to be involved in it. You very much can control the pace of the race and take care of the equipment at the same time. 
by doing the strategical teammate swapping back and forth through teams. Very, very smart if they can break the draft. How did you see that back and forth between that entire group there? Now, remember, we have the 1995 pole sitter. He's sitting next to me in the booth, Parker Johnstone. Also the 95 winner, Scott Pruitt. Scott, what are you watching? I'm seeing the same thing. Now, what the team Ray Hall's doing, they're trying to keep slingshot each, each other back to the front. This way, they can keep up good speed. If they didn't do this, if Max was to follow Kenny or Kenny just to Max, they'd lose too much speed, and that pack behind them would catch up. The way they're slingshotting back and forth, one, they continue to run a good, fast pace. They're resting their engine every lap, giving a bit of a breathe, and they're working as good teammates together, trying to break away from the rest of the pack. Yeah, but the rest of the pack isn't all that far behind. Paul Tracy now has third from Tony Kanaan, and it's just seven-tenths back. They cross the line, you got just a glimpse of the back end of Kenny Brack's car. What about Cristiano D'Amata, 21st? What's he doing, Jan? Paul, you had mentioned that he had dropped pretty far back from his 13th starting position. I checked with the team, and they said that they thought possibly the car got a little squirrely on him before the tires came up to temperature and up to pressure. But they say, as far as they know, he's A-OK -okay now. Well, from this view, you can understand how the draft is working the surge forward the drift back the turbulence that affects them at the back of the car Tracy and Kanan continue to battle for third place Tracy is high on Tony Kanan right now and much like the leaders maybe they figured out this is a pretty good idea for Kanan and Tracy as well so at this second Kenny Breck leads the Michigan 500 presented by Toyota. Second place is Max Pappas, but in just a few opening laps, we've had 24 unofficial lead changes. Part of the opening ceremonies there. Our first Toyota spot. And on the early laps, because he came flying up from 18th position. Look at him there as he goes high alongside Gidley, and then just sails right on through the field. Michael Andretti is having a great day. And Andretti just got around towards Akagi and picks up sixth place. So Andretti is making his presence known in this field. Adrian Fernandez was running in 12th place, and then all of a sudden he turned down on the pit road, and this looks pretty serious for Adrian, the owner-operator of that machine. Paul, the report is that he lost power. We'll try and get some more details, but that's what they're looking for. See if it's terminal or something they can fix. Now it seems that the uh, first six positions have all kind of figured out this. I'll lead one lap, you go then the next. Certainly that's what's happening with Kenny Breck and with Max Pappas, and here comes Tony Kanan. And at the same time, look back there, you're looking at, at Herta and Kanan, and then coming up quickly is Tracy and Andretti. Remember Dario and Dario Franchitti started in the back? See him come through there, he's already up to 14th place, so that car is working well for him. This is one of the few racetracks anywhere where these drivers can row, run in the low group, the middle group, the high group. Guys like Andretti that have so much experience here aren't afraid to try the high side up in the gray. Some of the newer guys, they feel a lot more confident, a little bit more secure down on the bottom. This track is all about confidence and experience. Tracy moves on Kanan. Across the line again. Look back to Tracy. Oh, and Michael Andretti trying to come up there, up behind Kanan, and Brian Herta's having a great run, sitting in third right now, and beginning to work the leaders. If their idea was to get away from the pack, it has not worked. Tony Kanan low on Tracy. With the three-inch extension this year of the hamper device, it's made that draft even larger. And even though Team Rahal now being on the front row, six out of ten events of having brilliant strategy at the beginning of working together, of pulling out maybe a quarter of a straightaway, it wasn't far 
enough, and these guys were able to utilize that draft and come right up behind the leaders. The race lap have been running at an upwards of 215 miles an hour. Jan Vikas. Amazingly, Paul, when you are on your own, you run 230 miles an hour down the straightaway. In the draft, they're saying they had to gear these cars for 250. The advantage for Team Ray Hall at the front of the field right now, they have the Lola chassis. The Lola chassis has a seven-speed gearbox. Therefore, they can use one through four to get up to speed, five, six, and seven, when they're actually out there in the draft. A lot of the Reynards don't have that option. Only team players, as well as Tora Takagi, have that seven-speed option. There's Brian Herta, who is now solidly in second place. Well, had the lead for just a second. Pappas came back on him, but he's solidly in second. Kenny Brack has dropped back to third. Tracy is fourth. The Penske cars are running 17th and 19th. Castro Nevis, 17th, and Adrian Fernandez climbs out. That's way too early for that man. Now Kanan is around Kenny Breck. Got Tony P3 going for Oh, look at this, going, going three going wide, wide, wide now. Paul Tracy comes up high to work on Breck. Michael closes in. That's Mamo Gidley that's in there tight as well. Gidley looking low on Michael. Tracy on Breck. So Tracy is passed. Gidley is passed. Kanan's going to try for second place alongside Herta. When you ask them before the race, almost all of these drivers said, I'm just going to get in the draft and cruise until the last 100 miles or so. Yeah, we see how that resolve is working out here. At the Michigan 500, presented by Toyota, at first it was a battle between the teammates, Kenny Breck and Max Pappas. Now, after seesawing back and forth constantly, it's Pappas that has situated himself solidly in the lead. Kanan going for second place alongside Ryan Herta, while Paul Tracy works on the outside of Mamo Gidley. Let's go to Scott Pruitt. That's exactly what we're seeing. One of the things we talked about before the race is the fact that they changed the Hanford device. All the drivers have said, this has left a bigger hole in the air. As we're seeing, even though these guys can get out the lead, the hole behind them is quite big. So even though they're able to take the lead for, I don't know, a quarter of a track or so, they're able to pull right back up and right back by. That's what's going on here. These guys are getting a feel for what's happening and what's going on, and it's been a great race so far. What's going on with Kenny Breck? Jan Vikas, you have any idea? I don't, because I'm standing by at the moment with Adrian Fernandez, who, as you said, Paul, flying from his car. Adrian, what put you out? I don't know exactly, but I start losing power. Uh, two laps before I retired, I was starting to feel a lot of loss of power. Uh, so, you know, I was starting to feel a lot of heat around my seat. So I came in and uh, they tried to fix it or find if there was something wrong, but they couldn't. And the engine sounds a little rough and we don't know if it comes from the exhaust or somewhere there, but there's something that is definitely wrong. I mean, we knew it was going to be a hard on equipment, but <laughs> we didn't think it was going to be that quick. Uh, they said the key to being hard on equipment is if you're flat out in the draft. Were you flat on the throttle all the way? I mean, I was in top gear drafting and just staying clear of, uh, of any problems and the car was the car was really behaving really nice and uh, I was just taking it easy and um, you know it's one of those things it's a shame but uh, you know we're still working hard and hopefully we get it thank you several times we've seen them go three wide Patrick Carpentier is now lined up behind Kenny Breck with Christian Fittipaldi behind him, Carpentier going to look low. And the radios are abuzz now with the team managers, the spotters, trying to convince their drivers to conserve a little bit to get back in the draft. Tony Kanan goes to the lead. But the problem is these guys are all racers. They want to be right at the point. If you're smart, if you've got a lot of 500-mile experience, you look at Mike Landretti, Kenny Breck, the 99-8500 winner, they know it's better to sit back and try to get this figured out for the last 50-mile sprint, not use it all right now. Well, with Kanan and Pappas at the front, shades of the 99 race there. Kenny Breck's problem, Gary Gerald. Now, you were asking about that when Jan ran down to check on Adrian Fernandez. We just checked in with the team. Kenny Breck reporting the car's gone just a little bit loose. 
Scott Remke, I got a quick word with him, the uh, general manager of the team said, are you just going to ride at this point? And he said, yeah. So I think the, we may look for a slight change on the setup aerodynamically for the balance of the car for Breck on the first pit stop. And you've got to keep in mind, this is the first time these cars have run at this speed with this rules configuration. They've never had this many cars on the track at this speed. Everything's going to change in this next pit stop to get the cars right for the track. At the line, it's been three later leaders, nine different changes. Way from the line, 44 different lead changes in the Michigan 500 presented by Toyota. Right now, it's Ford and then three Hondas. As after they got going at the end of the first lap, they look good. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. First pit stops have just been completed for Max Pappas, who flashed in. They made a half turn on the front wing. They also changed tire pressure by a half pound. He was here and gone in 10.7 seconds as we go to Jan Deacon. Tony Kanaan in the process of his service. No changes on the car. 11.5. Nice stop for Tony Kanaan today. You just have to make these pit stops with no mistakes. Gilda Perrin in, and we'll keep a close eye on the Penske cars. Because thus far, they have at least had, at very best, a conservative run. And you wonder what's going wrong there, if anything. Remember, they finished 1-2 at the Indy 500. Hey, Memo Paul. Gedley has picked up the lead of the race, John Beacon. Remember I said that the pit stops need to be without mistake. Tora Takagi, the car did not come up off the air jet. And it lost three seconds. That was a 14.5 second stop. So the Walker team needs to find out why that car didn't come up off the ground. Dario Franchitti, who has had an incredible drive from the back of the field, takes his first stop. Rest of the field stopping now. Gidley is staying out. Gary Gerald. We saw Franchitti get serviced in a fraction under 12 seconds. Roberto Moreno pulled out in front of Paul Tracy as Tracy comes in now and hits his mark, gliding perfectly in. This could be the first of five, six, or seven stops today, depending on fuel strategy. Tracy being held, he's over 12 seconds. Problems with the fueling device. They can't get it all in. Costly stop for Tracy. He throws his hands in frustration. 20 seconds. Now the fueling commences again. We can see the vapor, but they're still having problems. And Tracy is having himself just a furious moment. He's still being held. I don't know if they got the fuel in. The car has not moved. He's at 35 seconds. Gidley has come and gone. Kenny Breck is behind Paul Tracy as the drama continues for one of the tough luck drivers in recent weeks in the Kart Championship Series. There goes Breck. Tracy still waits as we hit 50 seconds on the clock. I've never seen anything like that. If it's an actual failure of that nozzle, unbelievable. Paul Tracy fights his way up to the front, and then in the pits, that failure. Oh, my goodness. Unfortunately, I have seen it before. It's happened to me several times after uh, some of my best drives where we've had problems engaging the fuel probe, trying to get the levers to operate at exactly the right time. And for Paul Tracy, who was driving brilliantly, he went four laps farther than Matt Whoa! Pappas had. Christian Fittipaldi had picked up the lead, but coming into the pits, he lost it, didn't touch anything. They're going to get him turned around. Going to have to pull him back first. Here's Fittipaldi on the pit approach. You've got carbon fiber brakes, which require a lot of heating. You're trying to get the car downshift. You can see him just bounce off the wall with the right rear. Watch it one more time. Watch the right rear. It just barely kisses the wall there. Hopefully he didn't damage. You can see the market left up there against the white wall. Brian Herta picked up the lead. They're still green on the race course, Young. So he's going to come in for his routine service. This is good for him that he was able to go this far on the fuel. Thus far, no changes on this car. Again, a 500-mile race. You just have to try to be delivered. Oh, there's some front wing change quite a bit. Nice stop for Brian Herta. You want to try and do that all day. You remember Cristiano D'Amato was running well in the back. Well, with these stops, he picked up the lead of the late race, but struggled a little on the pit stop. Now he's away. So is Oriel Servia. And Herta will go back to the lead. All of the stops under the green. Fittipaldi's spin was on the pit entrance. 
and as a result, it didn't have any effect on the course itself. Gary Gerald. Well, the problem for Cristiano De Mata when he came in, they had a problem on the right front, and they didn't get the wheel all the way on when the car came down off the jacks. So they manually lifted the front end of the car while they got that right front in place, bolted it down, and sent him on his way. It's good to have some big guys on the team. Jack doesn't work, pick it up, put it on. Well, and you've got to consider they're also the <laughs> Cristiano De Mata. It's about the smallest guy you'd want to have to lift. Scott Pruitt, you've been watching the Team Green. Yeah, just down there talking to them. They aren't sure what happened. They had a hard time getting it plugged in. They worked and worked and worked at it. And then once it was plugged in, there was no fuel coming into the, into the car itself. They aren't sure what happened. They're looking into it, and they actually may change the probe before the next stop. They're still working with Christian Fittipaldi. Gidley. Gidley comes around Pappas to the lead. Heard it. Went to the pits. It dropped him back to 10th place. Kanan sits there in third, Andretti is fourth. What a great story this is. Start of the year without a ride. One of the nicest men in the sport. Incredible success in shifter carts. And then Chip Ganassi gave him the opportunity, and he's taken it and run with it this year. Replacing Nicholas Manassian in the cockpit of the number 12 car. There's your pit summary. Freeze on lap 35. Tagliani got an amazing jump. So did Michelle Jordan Jr. And the thing to look at during that round of pit stops, Brian Herta able to go, go seven laps farther than Max Pappas. You project that out to the end of the race. That means Brian Herta will get a bonus of not having to stop. He'll go one stop less than Max Pappas. Going fast on the track and getting great mileage. What's the story on Christian Fittipaldi on? At the moment, they're trying to get him to his pits. The two right tires are punctured, and as you see the front tire roll around, there's a flat spot, and the same with the rear, so there is no air in the right side. They have no opportunity to push the car unless they get it on the dolly. This is going to take a long time to hope they can salvage some points for Christian. And Jan, about 200 yards up the road, the crew anxiously waiting, watching this drama play out. The frustration factor couldn't be any greater for the Fittipaldi crew. Christian Fittipaldi thus far. As you ride with Mauricio Guzman at the front of the field now, it is Mamo Gidley, his Toyota, then a Ford, then a Honda. Now our Toyota Spotlight takes a look at Christian Fittipaldi. He's had some interesting rides here. You remember last year on the back stretch, all of a sudden, off on the grass, now been replaced, thankfully. Bouncing across the road. He was bruised just from those bounces. And today on the pit road. Some frustrating times for Christian Fittipaldi. Great aerial shots that you've been seeing are brought to you by the courtesy of the folks at Fujifilm America. And their 206 foot long, six story high Fujifilm blimp. There she is. Changes at the front, Gidley, Pappas, Kanan, Andretti, Breck, those are the top five. It appears that whatever was problematic for Breck has now been cured and he's settled in. They're running laps 213 miles an hour to the 50 lap point. Well, at 50, Gidley was the leader. Tagliani, this with a remarkable move forward, much of that helped by his pit crew. Pappas, Kanan, Andretti, Breck, Jordan, Frankini from dead last, now up to seventh position. Cristiano Tomata also making a nice recovery up to tenth spot as we ride along with him. That's Carpentier just ahead, and here comes Jimmy Vassar. Jimmy Vassar, the winner of the 1996 U.S. 500 million dollar payday. Well, Jimmy Vassar is kind of slowly cruising his way toward the front, too, Jan. And it's interesting that he is doing it in a pack of cars. 
Today he said he thought this race would be like a Tour de France where you run in a pack called the Peloton. He says, I want to run in the Peloton. The idea is that's how the riders save energy in their legs. When you ride in the Peloton here at the Michigan 500, you're not saving your leg power, you're saving fuel. So he hopes he can run in the pack and then have the big killer run at the end. He wants to be like Lance Armstrong. Oh, and look at Herta's run for the front. And look at Max Pappas, who just moved. While we were watching Herta's move, Pappas moved around Gidley, took the lead. So it's Pappas, Gidley, Kanan. Two very different strategies here. Jimmy Vassar could be the stereotypical Southern California surfer dude. He is so laid back. You go into the other motorhomes, they're watching race tapes. Jimmy's playing his guitar. He is a master of super speedways. Very, very smart. He knows how to lay back and get the most out of his car, what the car needs to feel like. Then you've got Max Pappas at the front. Italian just wants to lead this thing. He doesn't care about anything else. Remember, you got to lead that last lap. That's what Jimmy Vassar's looking for. That's what Max Pappas wants. I'm, I'm down here with Mark Johnson, who's talking to Max Pappas. He said the car is good. We're real happy. We're just being smart right now. We're taking control of the race. We're just pacing ourselves. We're going to make a slight tire pressure change next time in. But other than that, Max is really happy. And Max, as you saw, just fell back to second place. Still battling with Mamo Gidley, who sits out in the top spot. Now, what happened? The question is, what happened with Paul Tracy, Gary? Well, there's more than a certain irony involved in a 54-second pit stop for Tracy as he tried to get fuel on board his car. We've got a backup car down here from the Patrick team. This is Jimmy Vassar's car. And the irony here is the fact that CART mandated what they thought would be an aid to refueling for this event. There is a ring that has been added here on what they call the Buckeye. This is the receptacle where the fuel is taken into the car. Well, with this additional ring here and the way it's coated, they thought it would help in taking the single probe refueling, pulling it in there and making a better seal and a quicker, more effective fueling of the cars. Some of the teams have been having problems in recent events with this bulky device. They thought this would help. Obviously, it did not help for Paul Tracy in that costly, costly stop. They continue to seesaw at the front. Pappas had the lead the last lap around. Now Gidley has it. Breck is third. Michael Andretti has moved into fourth. There goes Pappas again. Clear outside. And Gidley comes back. There's Michael. Now we'll just ride on board third place, Kenny Breck. into the turbulence there. See the shaking in the wheel. Jan Beekert. Nino Gidley, our leader. You may wonder, Paul, the last time he led was in Cleveland, and the target team used the strategy of as much fuel as he wanted to get to the front. I asked if that is what they had used today. They said no. Initially, we gave him fuel, but we didn't need it because we were running in the draft. But now that he's up at the front with Max Pappas, he is using more fuel. It's so interesting to see some of the fuel numbers up and down pit road. The guys in front are making two to three tenths of a mile an hour less than those running in the draft. Seventh place Vassar with both Tracy and Franchitti running with him. And you've got to play out that strategy, as Jan said. Brian Herta in that last round of stops will pick up a free stop by race's end. So these two teammates should work together to try to get as much speed at the best mileage possible. Tracy and Franchitti together. This could be interesting. Here comes Cristiano D'Amata. Scott? Well, they have a problem. On the last round of pit stops, they had a problem with the jacking system. I just talked to a few of their guys. They said from here on out, they're going to have to do manual jacking, which means every time they're going to come in, they're going to pay a penalty of five to seven seconds at each stop because they have to lift it up manually. So you look back from Cristiano D'Amata. Look at Jimmy Vassar coming in now. 
just back and forth all around this course. Leaders last lap at 211 miles an hour, and the lead changed again. It's now Gidley back in front. And a year ago, Gidley with the John Delapena's team finished 10th, but he ran at the front very, very strongly all day long. Very confident here, very secure in the knowledge that his engineer, Bill Pappas, gave Juan Montoya great cars here, and confidence is a real key to succeeding at Michigan, where you've got to be very brave, but also very smart. At the line, we've had six different leaders, 21 lead changes. You're watching the leader, Mamo Gidley, driving for the target Chip Ganassi team, followed by Pappas. There's Bracken Michael Andretti. Move a little further back in the field to 11th place, looking for Brian Herta and Alex Tagliani. There they are. Two blue and white cars. It's Tagliani that's low on Herta. opportunity to take a look at one of these tires after what was that quick innocent spin by Fittipaldi. Take a look here at the right front and Jan was talking about the tire wear as they struggled to push it, a deflated tire up the road. But look at you can see all the layers from the outer rubber into the core all the way down. It's like counting the rings on a tree practically and then eventually it went all the way through and it was totally deflated. Not often that you see one of these and it was a real problem for the crew because they couldn't roll the car efficiently back to the pits for new tires. Cost him all that much more time on pit road. Didn't just deflate the tire. Certainly deflated Christian Fittipaldi's approach to the race. I don't know if that tire is six years old or but it gives you an idea of how thin those carcasses are. The thinner they are, the less heat they build up. And they control the stability of the sidewall of the tire by air pressure. And we'll be hearing more about changes in air pressure as this race goes on when they fine-tune these cars to the track conditions. Well, in reality, what controls a lot of the theory of the tire construction for a race car is how far can the car go on a 35-gallon tank of fuel. So if you only have to go 70, 75 miles, then that's what you build it for. Exactly right. The grippier it is, the lower the lap times, but of course, the quicker the wear. So Firestone then calculates its tire life by how much fuel and how far these cars can go on a tank of fuel. With Mamo Gidley running at the front, Max Pappas in second, his teammate Kenny Breck at third, passing over the 71st, 71st lap now. And the guess is probably 14, 15 laps, we're gonna see everybody back into the pits. They've been green ever since the start. They waved off the first lap and then they went green. They've been that way ever since. And when they come in, one of the things that they're gonna look at is tire pressure. And Scott Pruitt, you have an idea of how they advance that thinking. Well, what's going on right now, the engineers have the ability to watch the tire pressure in all four tires. What they're looking at, they have sensors. Each one of these has sensors for two reasons. One, in case they pick up debris on the racetrack, that a potential tire could be going down, keep drivers out of harm way. And two, to actually make changes in the car itself to try and improve that handling. The driver's talking back and forth to the engineer. The engineer's continue looking at tire pressure, and he'll make changes before that actual that pit stop happens. Kenny Brack has turned a lap at 219 miles an hour. Last couple of laps, they've been at 215. That's the race pace. 
Adding on what Scott said, one pound of tire pressure change can be the difference of 50 to 75 pounds of effective springing of the tire. It's like changing the spring rate of the car. It changes the stability, also changes the ride height. So we heard on the last round of pit stops, one car went up a half a pound on the right front, down a half pound on the left rear. That changes the weight diagonally. So instead of having to put more wing into the car to change the balance of the car and maybe cause more drag, they'll simply adjust the loading or aerodynamics of the car by changing the tire pressures. Gidley, Pappas, Brack, Andretti. Michael starting 18th quickly up into the front of the field. And both of Team Green's cars are on the pit road. Gary Gerald. We're at the Pappas pit, but as we look in the other direction toward pit out, we see both the Team Cool Green cars coming in. Paul Tracy closest to us, and then on to uh, Dario Franchitti. Off the jacks is Tracy. Off the jacks is Franchitti. Both are rolling. We await Pappas as we go to Yambikas. Tony Ganon just dropped off the jacks behind him toward Takagi. Has still had with his jacks. That's 11.7 for Tony Kanaan. But Tora Takagi is still on pit road. This is the second time that they've had a problem with their air jacks. He's lost all kinds of time. And here comes Max Pappas, Gary. We look up the line. Roberto Moreno rolls by us. Now Takagi goes by. And here comes Max. Mike Landretti also coming into his pit about four or five pits away. Check with Mark Johnson, said there'd be no changes on the Pappas machine in this stop. Everything looking routine, fueling looking good. It's complete. Just 11 and a fraction seconds as he's away, and they work on Andretti, and Andretti rolls. Roberto Moreno also stopped on this round. The leader, Mimo Gidley, comes in, Jan. We're watching for any changes on the car. Resetting the fuel is an important. Oh, the right front. Well, that was just a minimal problem. Nice job for our leader, Mimo Gidley. And you can certainly hear the sound of that single-sided turbo. Well, my guess, Jan, is that uh, he's well satisfied with that car. He has been satisfied, and in fact, they made some few changes on the first stop. Now he's very happy camper. Oh, Kenny Breck picks up the lead of the race once again, the pole sitter. Here Tagliani for routine service. Good on the mark. Comes in from 12. to the front wing there. Scott Pruitt. Everything is good for Michael. He's happy with the car. He came in. No changes. I'm happy. Everything's going good. I'm just biding my time trying to get this thing to the end. Michael Andretti and Mimo Gidley as they move inside of Mauricio Guzelman. Kenny Breck has the lead. Michelle Jordan Jr. has come back into second place with Cristiano D'Amata third. But we still have some stops yet to be performed. How do they do that lap after lap? Here comes Pappas. Pappas is 13th. One position going for two. Inside. Inside. Jordan is in the pits now from second. And man, he's having a great run today. They took another turn out of the front wing. They said the car was loose earlier. Wow, this Herodes crew is doing a great job. Harry? Well, we watch Michelle work up the speed. Remember, 50 miles an hour on pit road. Scott Nixon trails him as they pass us. We're at the Kenny Breck pit. Elio Castro Nevis goes rolling by. And here comes the yellow and white colors of Kenny Breck, the season championship points leader. Scott Remke with the usual reminders on the radio. Revs up right at the last moment, and they completed fueling 11.2 on my stopwatch. Cristiano Damata is in and still struggling as they go to manual on getting the nose off the ground. Paul, they broke a seal on the air jacks on that car. They'll have to use manual lifting the rest of the day. The service is complete, and Damata goes by. Well, with them prepared for it, that means only a couple of extra seconds, but those are critical at Michigan. The 
Cars are out at the track doing 220 miles an hour. A lot of real estate's used up in just a couple of seconds. And so Brian Herta has taken over the lead of the race. Fastest lap thus far has been turned in by Kenny Breck at 219 and a half miles an hour. The closest major in over 20 years coming into the final round, the British Open. And if you missed this morning's coverage, then coming up after the Michigan 500 presented by Toyota, we'll have a wrap up of the full final round action for you. Well, back in Michigan, Kenny Breck has the lead. Brian Herta, Oriel Servia both went into the pits. Uneventful and routine stops. Good news for them. In second place is Mamo Gidley and Max Pappas, followed by Michelle Jourdain Jr. and Michael Andretti. And the two guys we have to keep our eyes on are Brian Herta and Oriel Servia. Servia playing the fuel game better than anyone else. This morning he asked me, what do I need to do to win this thing? And I said, Oriel, patience. Very bright man, engineering degree from Catalonia, Spain, and given the kind of fuel mileage he's getting, he very well could come out on top of this whole thing. So you see how Kenny Breck goes a gear as he comes into the turbulence, the weight turbulence that comes off of the car just ahead of him. Frankiti, boy, his team did a wonderful job for him. Those are the pit stops, the second round of stops just completed, and we freeze at lap 74 and then show you the positions advance. Jan Vikas. You mentioned, Paul, the pit stop for Brian Herta. Yes, it was routine, but they added rear wing to the car. They have a dial device on the rear wing, on the Hanford device, and they give that a couple of clicks, which will give you about a quarter inch more wicker on the back of the car. So we're seeing a lot of adjustments that could be very, very important come the end of the race. That's going to make the car a little bit slower down the straightaways, creating a little bit more drag. It also produce a little bit more downforce as well. The car will be a little better in traffic. Scott Pruitt. That's exactly what's going on. Now, you have to remember, only about half of these cars have that option to make that adjustment on the rear. Most of Lola's do not. And so what's going to happen is they have more flexibility. Some of these teams have more flexibility, just like Brian Herta, to make those changes during the race. In traffic, you want more downforce on the car. But as things thin out, you want to trim that thing down and try and get a little bit more speed out of it for the end of the race. Well, Tony Kanan, Michael Andretti, they keep working on one another. That's a battle for fifth place. kanan has got it right now. 73 unofficial lead changes. That means total lead changes. At the line, we've had seven leaders for 26 changes. And Parker, now on the 92nd lap, we're into uncharted territory coming this far without a yellow. Well, it's been three years since the last time we had gone far at all, a total of 80 laps without a yellow flag. Now we're working lap 92. We haven't seen a yellow. This is pretty phenomenal. It could change the whole complexion of this race as these pit stops and the save fuel starts to accumulate during 500 miles. Jan Vikas. What's amazing, Paul, and I don't want to jinx anyone, but <laughs> look at the number of the cars that are still running. Adrian Fernandez, the only retirement at this end of pit road. That is very impressive as we enter into this uncharted territory because there was concern about engine reliability. And we're going over about the 186th mile, too. And the point there is that 225 miles is as far as they have raced thus far this year. So once they get out beyond that, then we're into all new territory. Gary? Gary? Quick update on Oral Serbia to follow up what Parker was saying about keeping an eye on this guy. First pit stop came at lap 42, then they stretched it about 43 or 44 laps on the second stint. That's better than 2.5 miles per gallon. That's a pace that means a five pit stop race if you continue to run under green as we are. If you can make that one or two fewer stops, it could be huge when it comes to crunch time, even though Serbia has slid back to about, what, 16th, 17th, I think, Paul? Yeah, he slid back now to 17th, but that, that doesn't matter at all, does it? Well, in this situation, absolutely not. And the strategy that they've got is spot on. They're getting better mileage than anybody out there, with the possible exception of Brian Herta. Well, what could be an issue, though, is with the exception of the front seven, the rest of the field is all running a lap behind the leader. Kenny Breck working now on his 96th lap. Everybody else is back sitting on the 95th lap with the exception of Gidley, Pappas, Jordan, Kanan, Andretti, Herta, and Frankiti. Long back stretch, there's Gidley. You can 
see there are two distinct group of groups of cars, sort of the hares at the front, the tortoises at the back of each of these groups. Racing drivers can't help but go to the front, but if you've had a lot of experience in these 500 mile races, you know you've got to lay back, breathe the engine. Past our viewing point, every once in a while we'll hear someone on the rev limiter. You can't afford to do that. You've got to get these engines to last 500 miles. These engines are built at most to go 400, so going that extra 100 miles takes a little bit of maturity from the driver to try to nurse it and set it up for that final sprint towards the end. Third place, Max Pappas in traffic alongside of Roberto Moreno, Jimmy Basser ahead. He's not contesting with them. He's trying to catch up to Gidley. When you're talking about traffic, the one thing that the Lola has advantage over most all the rest of the cars, which we mentioned at the top of the show, was they have seven speeds. Talking to the engineers down here, that has been critical, getting that just right. They want to stay out of the rev limiter. That actually does a slight amount of damage to, to the engine itself. They don't want the engineers, especially the engine guys, do not want these guys run on the rev limiter all day long. They're trying to be careful. The Lola's have an advantage if they have seven speeds in their gearbox. You're riding now with Bruno Junquera, second car for Chip Ganassi stable. That's Roberto Moreno ahead. We mentioned earlier, there goes Kenny Breck. <laughs> Kenny Breck's at the front. We mentioned Moreno earlier because on Friday, he had an awesome crash here, spinning it off of the second turn, down into the inside barrier. Had it not been for all the work they've done, oh, Jill DeFerrin's pulled off the course. Jill DeFerrin pulls off. DeFerrin was running 15. If you can, keep going. Well, Jill DeFerrin comes to a stop. At any rate, Moreno, it snapped his head hard, but he had the Hans device on, and they say that may, in fact, have saved his life. DeFerrin into this race is fifth in the Drivers' Championship. Pappas, now up battling at the front, going to battle with his teammate. is a yellow for debris. It came out just after they started the 101st lap. Finally, they're going to get a rest. Fewest caution laps run here, 24 in 93. Believe it or not, that field is actually slowing. They'll have to make that good. I'm watching this uh, little tussle here as far as regaining Kenny, position. You one left turn up here. You okay where you're at? I think that I got to take one turn to front wing out of this thing. Under the yellow, and we also just saw Gidley go by the pace car there, one of the safety vehicles. It was a little hard to see. It was that flash that you saw at the top of the screen. Well, the pace car is now entering turn three. And Gidley went blowing by it, as far as I could tell, as the pace car is trying to pick up the leaders. So now he's got Kenny Breck. Uh, this is very interesting. He went falling past the pace car at a very good rate of speed. Gail Truist driving the pace car. To have Gidley, who just went by. You just stay where you are until someone waves you by. That continued disagreement as to the positioning of these... I'm staying here. <laughs> Kenny Breck's not going anywhere. I'm not taking any chances at all, says Breck. He likes being behind the pace car. That means he's the leader. But the interesting thing was watching Mimo go by the pace car when he was the leader of the race. Didn't hesitate at all. The pace car firmly established on the track. It was down the middle of the back straightaway. So it wasn't any confusion of the pace car coming out of the pits. And there's the line. So... What the heck what happened has, there? What right. has Gidley done perhaps to himself? Well, at the moment now, they are having the first discussions that Mike Hall has had from the Ganassi team with CART just took place. There was no CART officials that came over when 
Gidley went by the pace car, so we made the assumption then that Cart had no problem with that. Now the team and Cart are trying to figure out what do we do next. Well, Mike came back to the scorer's stand with a smile on his face, but I'm not so sure it wasn't a cynical smile. Well, at this point, they'd have to wave everyone by to get to Mimo. Uh, this is going to be interesting. And Something he, always unusual happens oh, here. Oh, you bet. He was set up to stop, by the way. So they are not only eager to get him back to the lead, but they want him to get him on pit road as well. well the pits are still going to be closed as the pace car comes by, at least at the back of the line. And if he was going to come in on that lap with the pits closed, he's going to have to do two, maybe three laps more than they intended. He will be doing it slower. That will help. We saw Paul Tracy very much trying to maintain his position in front of Kenny Breck, trying to get waved by to gain a lap back. He's currently two laps down. We've seen races in the past where, for example, Jacques Bellenoub was a couple laps down at Indy and was able to go on and win the race. So just being a lap or two down doesn't put you necessarily out of contention with great pit strategy and a few very lucky breaks. But it looks like Paul's now settled back into that spot behind Kenny. They're still showing Gidley as the leader. Now what are they going to do about Gidley now? How are they going to figure it out? Well, Saturday, ABC Sports is going to bring you soccer's top players. It's an exciting showcase of talent. The East Square is off against the West from San Jose, California. The Major League Soccer All-Star Game, Saturday, live at 3.30, 12.30 Pacific on ABC. There's a sign that tells you whether or not the pits are open. Jan Vikas, can you make sense out of what's going on here? Well, possibly Mike Hall can. He said he could speak to us for a moment. Mike? Well, what they're going to do is the entire field is going to pass the pace car. You are the leader of the race. When the pack-up is complete and everyone is behind you, the pits will open. There you got it. Well, that's right on top of it. Got the word as Gidley got the word. They've begun passing cars by the pace car now, looking for Mimo to pick him up as the leader. It's a moment, though, that does give the drivers some apprehension. They want to make sure they've absolutely been waved past. Now, it's quite obvious there. And there they grab... That's Chung Kara. They waved it on by. They hesitated as well. Well, we've seen races thrown thrown away simply because of miscommunication between the pace car and the drivers. That's why everyone's being very careful here. So we heard Kenny Breck saying, I'm not going anywhere. You want to be very clear on where you're supposed to be. Gidley catches an enormous break here as they wave the field around. And part of the problem with Gidley may be that the radio is not working as well as they would like. Gary Gerald. Just check with Scott Remke. He said, Scott, are you okay with this decision? Any problems? A big smile. No, we're fine. They, they knew what the situation was. And even though Kenny didn't want to give up that spot behind the pace car, he'll be number two in the procession here very shortly. Also interesting, Paul, that the signboard men for both Bruno Giancara and uh, Mimo Gidley are directly across from the pits of Kenny Breck, almost at opposite ends of the racetrack. And I'm assuming uh, Parker, former driver, Scott, Jan, that's because the speeds are so high they want to give you as much time to get settled on the front straightaway to find your board man, I'm assuming, rather than down toward turn four. That's absolutely right, Gary. You try not to rely on that signboard because it's very difficult to see at these speeds, but it's tried and true to old-fashioned techniques that work no matter what happens electronically with your car. So now here is Gedley finally behind the pace car. During this round of pit stops, you might think the drivers get a break for 11 to 12 seconds. It's a very busy time with these carbon fiber rotors. They don't use the brakes at any time on the track. They're left foot braking to put heat into those brakes. Usually, as you're coming off the track at over 220 miles an hour, mentally, you have to slow down to that 50 mile an hour speed limit. Imagine you're on the freeway doing 75 miles an hour. For some reason, you have to slow down to 55. It feels like you're walking. Imagine going from 220 down to 50. It's very difficult to judge. And then the transition from the asphalt onto the concrete. The concrete's very, very slick. It's hard to hit your marks and then reset the fuel, sway bars, and weight jacker. That's just part of it. You have to remember, these guys are coming down in a group. Everybody is coming in. The lead lap cars will be first and everybody after that. What you're thinking of is coming in, carrying as much speed to the line, hitting that mark, carrying the limit all the way down pit lane, picking up your, 
your pit man on the on the right hand side as you're coming down and then picking up the left hand side coming up hit a nice stop right on your marks let the guys go to work car goes down takes off and hopefully it's a clean pit stop Jan? We watch as they come on the pit road, Scott. We'll see how that unfolds. Of course, Mimo get Oh, what is Kenny Brett goes to the inside of him. Oh, the team is the team made a gesture to Kenny Breck that I can't repeat. But <laughs> <laughs> what the heck was going on there? You assume that the speed limits were not the same amongst the cars. Very quick up. Very quick up. Kenny Brick in his spot now as they service his car. Michael Andretti rolls by. Max Pappas, teammate to Brick right behind him, fielding complete. That's under 11 seconds. Now he got a traffic jab. Pappas was a little slower at 13.4 seconds. Well, let me tell you what Kenny Brick did there. He stayed on the 50 mile an hour limiter longer because his pits were further down. Mimo started to back off a little bit earlier. His pits were a little farther up. And because of that, Michael Andretti. Scott, what's going on here? They came in. They wanted to trim out the car a little bit. What happened was they're getting a, a, turn, a, a change on the rear gurney. They got it out, and when they went to put the other one in, they didn't get in all the way. He will have to come in and make another stop. If you can see, the gurney's hanging about halfway out on the back side of that wing. Gurney, Wickerville, a lot of different names for it. It's that tab on the trailing edge of the wing, rear wing. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. Up above and doing its own laps around the speedway at a whopping 20 miles an hour, the Fujifilm blimp with Captain John McGuirk and Will Fanshaw at the controls. Giving us some great shots here today. The British Open. Well, they started the day with 12 within one stroke. What a great run it was for David Duvall. And coming up next after the 500, our special coverage and wrap-up of today's final round of action in the British Open. Well, at the Michigan 500, it is Kenny Breck now in the lead behind uh, the pace car, still under the caution. It was a debris caution, no incident with the wall. Fewest number of caution laps, 24, 1993. Let's see how we fare today. Breck, Gidley, Pappas, Michael Andretti stopped, Brian Herta stopped, they got the, Gid the, uh, the rear wing, the wicker bill fixed on Michael Andretti's car, there he is, so he's in shape to go, and we should see a green flag come out once again at Michigan very quickly, it's Ford, Toyota Ford. Championship Series, the Michigan 500, presented by Toyota at Michigan International Speedway. At 107 laps, when the stops began, here's the improvements and the loss, especially for Jimmy Vassar, but look there in the middle. Those guys who did not pit, who are probably about 10 laps away from their stop, Junquera, Castro Nevis. Nakano, Zanardi, Carpentier, and Damata. It's a big gamble, but it's a gamble they have to take to get back onto the lead lap. Green flag comes out. We're racing again. Gidley immediately moves on Breck. So does Pappas. <laughs> Critical time for these guys. It's when they're closest together can actually get something done. Back there in fourth, Michelle Jourdain, Jr. Having a great day. Pappas back to the lead around Gidley. Gidley crosses the line in front again. Jordan Jr. is going to try Kenny Brick. And he's passed. That's what makes Michigan so great is the construction of this circuit allows the low, middle, high line, allowing the drivers around you plenty of room, plenty of air, plenty of side-by-side -side racing. Look how high Gidley could go in relationship to Max. The Michigan 500 presented by Toyota. We've had seven different leaders, 29 lead changes, but those are counted at the line. We're Approaching 80 now on the uh, number of changes away from the line. Paul Page with Parker Johnstone, Gary Gerald, Jan Vikas, 
we've got through it all with us. 78 different lead changes away from the line. We've been following Michael Andretti, looking for a third win. He's 13th, but he's still very much in the fight. Kenny Breck looking pretty strong. Wow, that's little Tony Kanan. Hi, Tony, how you doing? Those are the stories that we're following today. And a number of others. We've only had one caution period, and that for debris. Only two cars out. Jill DeFerrin and Adrian Fernandez. You could listen that time from the onboard how Kenny had to breathe the throttle right at the exit as he crossed the way to Max Pappas and Mimo Gidley. The leader gets a bit of an advantage mid-corner, running in clean air, but as they come onto the straights, you can see the person trailing draft right up, pulls straight out. Max dives right back down. That's why the spotters are so critical. You can hear them calling to the drivers. You'll hear, them, you'll hear them say clear, traffic left, so that they know that they can pull down, because you can see very little out of these mirrors, especially when you're in the corners. There was a tearaway bouncing there on the, on the pavement. They have a number of them they can put over the shield on their helmet, over the visor shield, so when it gets clouded up with oil and, and rubber off the track, you just pull it away. Clear view once again. Not unusual to have three to five of those strips on a race of this distance. The trick, though, is to make sure you get the right combination, right, left, right, left, right, or whatever you set it up to, because what you don't want to do is grab one of the ones on the bottom and tear them all off on a single pull. This is one of those times when drivers have really got to pick up patience. It's so easy to get out there and get racing right now. You get out there, some time's gone by, you want to get out there and go racing, this is the time you got to be conservative. you got to take care of your car. You are still quite a ways from the finish of this race. The smart driver is going to be the guy who takes care of his equipment right now. Oh, look at Tony Kanaan. Zoom, I'm the leader. Come catch me. That's one of those see ya. And look at the gap that he pulled out right away. We're seeing this top six group of cars. They all took on tires and fuel, and they are breaking away from the rest of the pack. And any time now, we should see those other cars that are running out of sequence come in for their stop. Listen how Kenny's got to be out of the throttle here because of the turbulence of the following cars. Now he can finally get back on the gas. He's picking up the draft. Watch him close on the entry to turn one. Sorry. This is where you have to be careful when you roll out of the corner. Sorry. All of a sudden the banking dumps off and you pick up all the turbulence from the cars running in front of you through the corners. Still that air, You're clear. That air moves up the track. It's not quite as big a concern as it is just on the exit of the corner. Side by side for the lead. Gidley, Kanan. Pappas moves on Breck. Look at that at the line. Two wide through one. And Kenny Breck tries to come back to the front. Side, side, clear. Now running with these extra pair of eyes, also, you always have to be on top of your game. Even though you have a spotter, you can't always trust them. They're just a second pair of eyes for to help you. I'm telling you, guys, I've been in trouble before where the spotter tells you to go and there's not enough room, so the driver has got to be on top of it as well. I absolutely agree with you. I lost my left side mirror once on an oval, and the spotter said, clear, no, just as I turned. <laughs> and it was too late at that point. So, Scott, you're absolutely right. you got to take care of yourself as well as the spotter. I like it when they say clear. Uh, oops, oops, sorry. <laughs> I hate when that happens. That was wrong. <laughs> Dario Franchini sitting there in fourth. Inside. Started last. Inside. Well, a big improvement for these drivers' visibility happened five, six years ago when they came out with convex mirrors as opposed to the flat mirrors allowed the drivers a much greater range of visibility up to about the beam position of the driver's head and back, but still with the rear wings, with the handful devices and the rear tires, a lot of your rear wood vision is blocked and they do have enormous blind spots out to the sides. Well, the stops have begun on that second group of cars. Alex Zanardi is into the pits. Here's to be routine for Alex. We keep an eye on the front of the field. I guess they should have warning labels on those mirrors that say caution. Cars behind you may be going a heck of a lot faster than you or something like that. About to put you a lap down. Yeah, could be. Frankiti in fourth place. 
working with his teammate there as we saw. Paul Tracy now three laps down. outside. Suddenly slows down and pulls off the course. Vassar was 12. Are we now starting to see that worry about engines? We don't know why DeFerrin pulled off. Vassar just pulled off. I just talked to these guys down at Patrick's Pits and they think there's something, something wrong with the engine. They aren't sure whether it's electrical or engine or what it might be, but uh, Things don't good, look, look good for uh, Jimmy Bassett right now. Well, with temperatures in the 90s, you expect the engines to be stressed to their max. But Jimmy Vassar pulled off the course. There's your leaderboard on the engines in the upper left-hand corner. And it's just not the engines themselves. You have to consider how hot with the heat soak that the bodywork gets, the electronics, the wiring looms, everything is pushed absolutely to its limit because on a road course where these guys are running for a couple hours, with the pit stops, the yellows that occur, the lack of ambient heat normally gives time for everything to cool down a little bit, but a sustained 16,000 RPM run in 93 degree heat with track temps in excess of 120 degrees, it's very easy for some other smaller component to fail that takes, takes you out and ends your day. Paul Tracy does not want to give that lap up. is chasing the leader, Frank Heaty's given Pappas a good run for his money. And I remember too, these cars have a lot of computer power on board. Engine management, stuff like that, that's very susceptible to heat. Young Vikas, you have Jill DeFerrin? I do, and Paul, you mentioned a moment ago, we don't know what knocked Jill DeFerrin out. Let's find out. Was that an engine-related problem? Yeah, we're not so sure. Uh, basically, I lost power coming out of four there, and, uh, you know, they still haven't unlocked to see what it was, but uh, something that made us lose power. How were the track conditions up until that point? Uh, we were having an okay race. I mean, uh, we weren't fantastic, but we just try to get to, try to get to the end and score a few points. Now, the crews are burning up on pit road. What's it like behind the wheel? Is it enough air to get over you to cool you down? Well, uh, 
Oh, we had uh, some issue in the car. I was really, really hot in the car and uh, burned my feet and, uh, and, and something, but you know, there's something was going on. Maybe we were getting some uh, reflux from the radi radiator air or something like that. Well, at least you're, you're hot, but you're okay. Thanks, Jill. <laughs> now, powertrain something, says Jill DeFerrin. This group is battling all for the lead. Gidley, Breck, Pappas, Frankiti, Gary Gerald. Well, uh, an interesting radio conversation was monitored between Morris Nunn and Alex Zanardi a short time ago. Uh, Morris telling Alex that they do have a problem with the right rear caliper on the brakes. It appears to be leaking, and the thing that intrigues me is he says, I'll leave it up to you. So maybe Parker or Scott can relate to what this is all about, and what do you do in a driver when you get a message like that? Well, I'll tell you what, if it was me, I'd stay out there and run. I'd go right back to Morris and say, how much are we leaking? Is it just a drip? Or is it leak or is it pouring out? Because you got to realize the only time you use the brakes here is when you come into the pits. And so he can pump them up, come in, and do a stop without any problems at all. He can have a small leak in the rear caliper. Won't be a problem whatsoever. So as Zanardi should go back, when they do their next pit stop, they should take a good close look at how much fluid's coming out of that caliper. Well, and the other thing the driver can do if you're worried about locking up just one wheel, if just one is effective in the back and the other one isn't, because certainly you don't want to spin on the way into pit road, the drivers have an adjustable brake bias knob. He can dial more brakes to the front, take it a little easier on the way into pit road, but not take the chance of spinning. Of course, the big problem is if you leak brake fluid onto the rear tire, if it is a big leak, Goodbye. It could create an enormous problem because we know how slick brake fluid can be. Lead changes again, Brack around Gidley. Phenomenal. We mentioned Alex Zanardi and the decision that he now must make as we watch for battle at the front. Pappas comes up into second. Gidley, Frankiti, and of course Tracy, Frankiti's teammate, two laps behind. Split, we're going around again. Big out. Outside, outside. Oh, yeah. Outside, outside, one inside, you're clear. <laughs> inside, outside, side. Another one looking outside, another one looking outside, outside. <laughs> outside, clear. Boy, that's busy. Got to run. Inside. <laughs> Spotters are going to be hoarse at the end of this day. Remember, guys, the radio problem for Mimo Gidley, we don't know if he can hear his spotter, do we? And, no. and think about that in the traffic jam that he's running in as they take him again into turn one. We know that he has a radio problem. It's not been made clear whether it's transmit or receive or both, but certainly there is a problem as once again. They go side by side for the lead in the Michigan 500, presented by Toyota. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. Great race at Michigan in 1996, the inaugural U.S. 500, and the winner, winner was Jimmy Vassar. But today, with a sudden turn off the course, Jimmy Vassar's day is done. And right now, he's down by Scott Pruitt. Jimmy, uh, too early to end of your day, that's for sure. Dad, too early into your day, yeah. anything happen? Uh, I don't know, just uh, we had, uh, had some alarms come on. Could be a gearbox, I don't know, it start tightening up. And uh, just the way it goes, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. Got a lot of Visteon people out here. It's, uh, you know, a lot of lot near their hometown, home. I wish we could win this last race in Michigan. I usually have some pretty good, pretty good luck here, but I, I don't think the Raynards are any match for the Lola today. How was the car and how was the heat today? The uh, car was fine, and uh, yeah, the heat, I'm from Vegas, so heat doesn't get to me. But uh, yeah, I think today is going to be pretty tough to beat a Lola. Okay, Jan, Mimo Ginley making his routine stop, but he had a big brake lockup on the approach to his pit. No changes on the car that we have seen. Those Toyota single-sided turbos, they are loud when they pull out of here. <laughs> Dario Franchitti, while we were away, led the first laps officially or unofficially for his race today. Right now, he and Pampas are battling for the lead. Look at him swing wide there. Dario qualified fourth, finished third here last year. Outside, clear. Kenny Breck had an interesting moment as well while we were away. He got up very, very close to the wall. Look at this. Oh, oh baby. Missed it. We got 
got some breaking news down here. Mimo Gidley is getting a pit speed violation. We heard his revs go up like he had trouble shifting gears or maybe his finger came off the pit speed button, but this is gonna throw away the lead for Mimo Gidley. Brutal. And what you saw with Kenny Breck there, the shaking of the car was trying to get all the junk he picked up when he went high off the tires. You see him scrub tires at the beginning of the race? Well, that's how you do it at 20 miles an hour. I don't know if I'd be that aggressive with a steering wheel. This is Gidley answering the black flag for the pit speed violation. Oh, man. And again, Paul, it sounded, we heard something strange when he went down the pit road. So I don't think it was a, I think simply his finger maybe came off the button. One of the problems with a driver with lesser experience, he's not a rookie, but uh, there's one of the problems that can happen to you in a 500. Dario Franchitti is in. Hustling in from the back side, watching the service here. Paul Tracy was in moments ago, his teammate, and again they had a problem getting the fueling nozzle engaged. No problem for Franchitti as he rolls away. We think Kenny Breck and Max Pappas should be in with the next one or two laps. They're laid out for Breck now. There are so many variables that can go wrong during a pit stop. The drivers feel much better on the track than in the pit lane. Michael Andretti is in. Andretti comes in from fourth. And Tony Kanaan is in very on. The only change they made on Tony Kanaan was they took front wing out. The other person on this part of pit road on their way here would be Michelle Jordan. Gary? Rico Nolt, who changes on the right front, out in front, waving for Breck, who's on the road. Now they go yellow for debris, and the pit close sign is out, but Breck is already here. Here's Breck for the service. It happened, I believe, after he was clearly down pit road. Everything looks to be on target. Here, here the revs comes up. 13 seconds, and yes, they confirmed that he was already on pit road when the yellow came out, and then they had the closure of the pit, so no problem there for Kenny Breck. Yeah, same thing happened with Michelle Jourdain Jr. He came in from third place, and he was on the pit lane when the yellow came out, so you can go right on in. They've gotten quite creative with the uh, pit stop boards now, have they, in the pit lane? We saw the Motorola phone for Michael Andretti, the Shell fuel pump for Kenny Breck. You gotta be a little artistic. The second caution of the day, it's, it's a debris caution, and there's the debris. And here is Tony Kanan back in. And remember that Michael Andretti took the little strategy of topping up at the end of his stop. This doesn't appear to be that. He had problems. We could go with the uh, fuel nozzle. No, that's not what they're looking at, though. Either they have an engine problem here. It looks like they're pulling off the rear cowling. And they've shut the engine down. Never a good sign. And when you take off the left side pod, that's where the electronics are located. In case you want to, in fact, one of the crew members has one of those electronic components with him. At least it's under yellow for Tony Kanon. In fact, it looks like a battery. It may have changed the battery on the car. Ooh, get your hand out of there. <laughs> and you can see the pace car just past Tony Kanon's pit position, so he'll go a lap down with that stop. Patrick Carpentier, who's listed in eighth spot, is said to be very low on fuel. There's concern from his crew that uh, he they get the pits open in time for him to get in and get service before he runs out. Well, there's Carpentier. Hopefully he can get around. Pace car brings the field around. With the pace car having the field bunch, they should be able to hit the pits at the conclusion of this lap. I just talked to the crew on the, uh, the Miller car. Everything is good. The car's working great. We have no problem. And what a big break for Max and the whole Ray Hall team right now. And at least we forget that disappointing finish from Max. He actually lost this race in the last mile. Lost it to Tony Kanaan. Carefully talking everybody into the pits. Pappas is the first one to turn down. 
crew waits for him. Kenny Breck stays out. Gary Gerald. Interesting. Here, Mark Johnson. All the way down. Talking to Max. All the way down the road. He's still 100 yards or so away, but that closes quickly, even at 50 miles an hour. Boy, you talk about nice and easy. It was like a glider coming in here. Hold your brakes. Hold your brakes. Nice and easy. done. Max Pampas in and out. His teammate Kenny Breck stays out, stays in the lead, followed by Michelle Jordan Jr. And Brian Her well, Brian Hurtis sits there in fourth place. So we've had some incredible racing today at the Michigan 500 presented by Toyota, and that's the nature of our spotlight. Wide World of Sports update brought to you by Speed Pass. Today's way to pay. It's free from mobile. Well, in this mobile update, we're currently under our third caution of the day in the Michigan 500 presented by Toyota. There's some other racing going on. It's the Mopar Mile High Nationals out in Denver, Colorado. And this is how they look after qualifying. Terrific fight in the NHRA and you will have coverage on ESPN2 later this evening of the final rounds of elimination. When we return to the Michigan 500, there's going to be some green flags flying. Right now, though, the, uh, the end of this caution period is rapidly approaching. It's a caution again for a uh, piece of debris that they picked up fairly quickly. Fastest laps of the day have been turned by Patrick Carpentier at 221 miles an hour and then at 220 max pappas who has led a good portion of this race has also turned some laps above 220 miles an hour the caution yon beacons well you said it was debris and in fact it was debris from shinji nakano's car who has since Coming to the pits and retired from the race, so I asked team owner Tom Anderson what happened. He said, with a big grin, he said, well, we had engine cover failure. <laughs> <laughs> I think something happened underneath that cover. <laughs> Jan, I was trying to figure out where you were on the betting today on the way into the race as far as how many plenums we were going to lose. Well, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a plenum, Parker, uh, but they certainly, it certainly appears as though, had a, had a comprehensive <laughs> engine failure. Okay. <laughs> now, we're not being careful about this, are we? Well, Sinji talks with the crew from Japan Television. Gary Gerald? Just a quick update on track temperatures. Race started 93 ambient in the air here, and it was 128 on Pitt Road. Short time ago, temperature had actually dropped. We had a few uh, clouds for a while, and it dropped to 123. Those clouds have disappeared. It's heating up down here once again, guys. But we saw 141 degree track temperature on Friday. That's one of the highest numbers we've seen in kart racing in a long, long time. That's an enormous temperature. Consider all of the torture being put on these cars, the engines, the tires, the suspension, but perhaps most important, the drivers. The pit stops summary at lap 147. has just taken the green flag in the Michigan 500 presented by Toyota. Second place is now Kenny Breck. There are some other cars in there that are going to try to get their laps back. There goes Breck. Look at this group lineup. Looking back just a little bit further for Kenny Breck. There he is. So for the first time today, we're actually seeing some distance between first and second place though that distance is only two and a half seconds last pass at the line. A lot of lapped cars in between. Jankara amongst the group on the lead lap. We have Pappas, Brax, Jordan, Jankara, and Andretti. Jankara, however, will have to come into the pits in just the next few laps, and, and he'll lose that lap unless he catches a yellow. 
And Tony Kanan's bad luck continues. Jan Bikas? Yes, they are now on their second battery. So, in fact, they had changed the battery on the previous stop. They're going to have to bring him in every, well, how many laps was that? Maybe 20 laps and change the battery because the alternator has stopped working. They now have a collection of six of them here, so he's going to be making a lot of pit stops. Frustrating for Tony. You wonder in some ways whether or not it's worth it to keep trying. I guess it is. You can count on running some more laps under caution before the day is over. But for Tony Kanan, it's a drop from a battle with the lead to 19th and two laps behind the lead. Oh, oh, press, oh, baby. Oh, oh, yeah. Now three. And every time I watch this onboard, Paul, my heart starts to accelerate. I just miss driving here because this is one of the most phenomenal places to be in a champ car. Wide open, full throttle, the ultimate video game. Well, until something goes wrong and then it hurts a lot more takes on the aspects of reality real quick, doesn't it? Yeah, and I don't, I, I'm not saying that Foot Memorial Hospital isn't a great place, but I just hate spending my weekends there if I don't have to. You ride with Kenny Breck. Lola Chassis, Scott? Well, the thing you have to remember is the Lola seems to have a little bit of an advantage. They have a different underwing than, than the Reynard. The consensus is they're more efficient. I had a chance to talk to Jimmy Vassar uh, a few minutes ago. He was saying the Lolas are fast. They seem they can run less drag because the underwing is more efficient. What that means is the Lolas, I mean the uh, the Raynards have to put on a little bit more gurney to get the same amount of downforce, and that means drag. That means the top speed isn't going to be as good. And today it looks like the Lolas are pretty well dominating. Again, they go four wide. Pappas is the leader. Breck in second, Jordan Jr. third, then Michael, then Dario. sensors that they have, they have the ability to monitor the tire pressure. He came on and said, hey, your right front tire pressure is building a little bit. That means he's picking up some understeer in the car. Those are the things the engineers are on top of all the time, looking at that tire pressure. Is there anything he can do about it? Not right now. Not until they make their stop. He'll look at the tire pressure and they'll make a wing adjustment and more probably they'll going to take a, a pound or two out of, the, out of the right front tire trying to make that car work a little bit better. They call themselves technical teammates. Michael Andretti is part of Team Green. Different sponsor, and he battles with Dario Franchitti. Bruno Junquera, as expected, in the pits. Of course, what the driver can do to try to take care of that problem is they have a weight jacker, which affects diagonally the corners of the car, usually from the right front to the left rear. As that tire pressure builds, it essentially lifts the right front up in the air, creates more understeer, as well as increasing the spring rate of that tire. So what the driver can do is, through a hydromechanical system, is actually lower that corner of the car back down, get more grip to that right front to help the car turn into the corner. They also have adjustable roll bars. They can also soften the front a little bit and get the front of the car to roll a little bit more on the way in. Changes the feel of the car, may correct a handling problem, but it could destroy the feel or give the driver less, less con confidence, depending on how the cause and effect reaction works with those changes. Oh, this is great. Back and forth. Frankiti Andretti. Battle for fourth. And Kenny Breck finds himself in the middle of traffic as well. Oh. This is when you don't want to step out of line. I mean, these guys are running wheel to wheel, side by side, three wide. Everybody has to keep their wits, keep their head about them. Any little, oh, any little pay up in the cray. Oh, right there. That's where we saw it before. He just got pushed up really high in 3-4. And that's... Michelle Jordan Jr. is coming in to challenge Kenny Breck. Jordan Jr. low. Now Breck's having to fight that car. Again going high, cost him. Looking inside. Here comes Michael Andretti low. 
Frankini closes on the back of Breck. Is that momentum, Parker? It just takes that long for him to clean the tires and get back up to speed? It does. Wow. And, and once you are off the throttle and that high, it takes a while to get back into the groove. What Scott was talking about, which we saw, is one of the players' cars cutting from the high all the way down to the low groove. You can't move quickly. Two things, not only does it endanger everyone else, but if you cross the wake of someone and lose all the downforce on that car and suddenly regain it on the bottom side, remember Christian Fittipaldi last year going down the back straightaway, that's what happened to him. The car made an abrupt left-hand turn. He was very, very lucky to escape with only minor damage to the car himself. And there's the other great story of the uh, almost shy but very likable Michelle Jourdain Jr., who now finds himself in second place, Scott Pruitt. John, excuse me, Jan. Uh, that's all right. The Herodes Bettenhausen crew, as you said, Paul, are just thrilled. Uh, he's just doing a fantastic job. Just spoke with Tom Brown, his engineer, and said, make any changes today? He said, no, the car has been just about perfect from the start of the race. We've gone up one turn on front wing, and we've gone back down. We've just been tuning as the track changes. But at the moment, everything is going absolutely perfectly for this team. 174 laps complete. Pappas, Jordan, Michael Andretti, Kenny Breck. But still, the positions in the top 10 are very fluid. So much for we're just going to hang on and go single file until the last 100 miles. That worked, oh, for the first 100 feet. Well, we've heard the drivers all weekend long talk about the strategy of, oh, uh, we've got Tony Kanaan slowing down on the apron there. You can see as the cars blew by from the onboard. But they've talked about how they're going to lay back and how they're going to just wait until the end. Well, racers are racers. They want to be at the front of this one. And Tony Kanaan may be about to give it up, especially if he's in now because the battery has gone once again. It didn't get very far at all. Uh, there's your current standing. And the pit stops be coming up again very shortly. The crews are waiting. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. Today to provide you top to bottom coverage of all the action here. The great red, white, and green Fujifilm blimp. As it floats over the track, and you may have seen it just recorded that Alex Zanardi slowed over on the backside. And he's going to make it around to the pit entrance. Pappas is still the leader. Breck, Jordan Jr., now back in third. Michael Andretti, Dario Franchitti, and then Gidley. Alex Zanardi has made it all the way around now. One back here in 97, of course, won the championship in 97 and 98, but they're still working on the car, but I think his day is done. Eight different leaders at the line, 41 lead changes. So Parker now, we're moving to the last set of pit stops, theoretically the last step. Some may be able to make it one. Whoa, Frank Man, Katie. That's way up there. Oh, that does not help the tires. Well, we've seen They've Kenny do it again. We've seen Kenny. We've seen Kenny get up there a few times and had to back out of it. It's different going into turn one. I've been behind guys like uh, Scott Pruitt that actually used quite a high line on the, in the initial entry of turn one, but it's the exit of four that you have to be very careful of. Most of these guys are running mid-track to just a little a little right of exit. You get up there, the marble's up there, there's not a lot of rubber. It's very easy to then lose all the grip and just head up into the wall. We've seen time and time again, I know that it's happened to me, it's happened to Ray Hall, it's happened to Parker. <laughs> At this point in the race, they start getting some marbles up out of that high line. If you're not careful, especially you get a little bit of a little bit of uh, bad air off the car in front of you, you get up a little too high, you're going to go straight in the fence. Those are the kind of things these guys have really got to be concerned about right now. Well, we were just talking about that the other day. I asked you what happened in 97, and you asked me the same question, and we didn't know. You're down in the groove, everything's great, you're on throttle, and all of a sudden, boom, you lose all the grip, and you're up in the wall in just a moment, and there's nothing you can do about it. And it's a bad ride. It's it, a horrible ride. You oh, get harder yeah. than you can even imagine. I still hurt from that. Well, Alex Zanardi and Tony Kanan have both And Paul, Michael Andretti's in trouble. Michael Andretti just came by. 
engine sounded sour. Another Honda with trouble because both more Sun cars are now here on pit road. Yeah, Michael's coming off at two now and begins to slow down. He was in third place at the line. Look at the file go past him. Oh, the Andretti luck again. We look at motors now for Michael Andretti, Shinji Nakano. Alex andretti has got some sort of problem. We've seen Tony Kanan with his electrical problem. Well, let's find out. What happened to Alex Zanardi, huh? We will. We just saw Michael Andretti go by with an engine problem. Was that what happened to you as well, Alex? Uh, obviously, I had uh, a low voltage alarm on my dashboard for the last uh, 15 laps. So I was trying to ignore it, but obviously it was just a matter of time. They've been changing batteries on your teammate, Tony Kanan's car. He just behind us climbed out of his car. Sounds like it's the same situation. That was not the only problem. I had uh, no brakes uh, at the rear at the beginning of the race, and then I lost the front brakes as well. I could barely stop the car, so although you know I don't use the brakes in this course, you know, it was going to be insane to carry on, especially from where we were going to end up. So sorry for Pioneer and Wokam, but uh, the car was running good at the end, and I'm confident for the future, but today wasn't a very good day. And thankfully, he didn't have to use those brakes in a panic. Gary? Michael Andretti has pulled in, but he hasn't gotten out of the car. The bodywork is off the back, and they are checking Kim Green, Eddie Jones on the radio with Michael. Any indication of the problem, uh, Kim? Uh, I think we might have uh, lost something in the engine somewhere, and uh, we're running good. We had a bit of a misunfortunate situation early on where we we uh, made a little mistake in the pits and had to go to the back of the line, but uh, we had a good car. Oh, you're saying this day, this day is over? I think this day is over at this point. Yeah, I think the uh, we'll have a quick look, but we're not finding any anything at the present moment. I think we must uh, had sort of some sort of a problem internally. I think. All right. Thank you. Oh. Well, in the meantime, his teammate Frankini is just hammering on Kenny Breck. He just blows past them, but they've been going back and forth in an ongoing battle for second place. Well, we saw a couple of squeeze jobs there right up against the wall. I was standing up in my seat trying to get as thin as possible. That's what makes Michigan so great. You can do this lap after lap, low, middle, high. So Tracy right. down on the inside coming into the pits, it looks like. Remember, Tracy is well off of the pace. He's 11th, two laps behind the lead. Frankini going for the lead. Can he hold on to it now? Wow, look at him tuck right up behind. Tagliani. Tagliani there. Gets a bit of a toe. He's got to be careful on this corner. Tag goes low. Dario looks for cleaner air a little higher. They're all going to line up high. You see Dario, Max, and Breck using up every inch of road coming off the fourth corner. Back up to the top for turn one. Now it's all dependent on where Tag drives as to where they drive. Tag goes low, Dario stays up high, looking for clean air. Max slots in a quarter down below. Parker, let's go back to this pit stop scenario because we may have two different scenarios at play here. You're at the 191st lap, 250 is the scheduled distance. Now. Some people are going to try to make it with just one to go. And the question is, who can? Well, I've always committed never to do math in public, but that's what we're working on right now. And these guys are going to adopt one of two strategies at this point, which is the stand on it and go while you can. But can you break the draft? The other guys are going to play smart. They're just going to get in behind here, make sure they don't lose contact with the leaders. Obviously, they have to stay on the lead lap right now. That's only four cars, Frankie, Pappas, Brack, and Shordane Jr. We saw uh, Mamo Gedley pull down. Now. We want to keep our gearbox good to the end. Came out of fifth onto the pit road. You hear him talking about gearboxes, that's a problem. Remember, these guys are running with either six or seven top gears. The Lola's have seven. When you're coming in, that means you're running with three tops. When you're coming in, six to fifth, fifth to fourth are all pretty close, but then when you go from fourth to third or third to second, it's a big jump. You don't want to make that shift too soon, as we saw here a couple years ago. A lot of gears, a lot of problems with gearboxes because of that. Gently is back rolling. And of course, the upshifts are easy because you don't lift off the throttle. The computer automatically figures out the ignition and 
fuel break needed in order to match revs, but on the downshifts, as, as Scott said, the problem is it takes a very subtle light flip of the throttle downshift through the top gears you have in the box, and then the timing is very different on the lower gears where you need a big blip. to go. That may be stretching the issue, Paul. We'll see what kind of service they can give Dario. Been a remarkable day. We mentioned early on, this is one of those races where it's not so important where you start. He started 25th. He's been a factor lately, and he's a factor again in 12.9 seconds. He's only going to make it one more stop if they have a yellow, or make it to the end as this being the last stop, if they have yellow, so then it gets into short fueling. Do you short fuel now and hope there's not a yellow? Make sure that you've got one more stop. I mean, this is an interesting strategy to pick a track position now. Well, they fully fueled the car there. Of course, you would. You're going to have to stop, I would say. I, I can't imagine you making it that far. So if you think it's going to go green, Paul, do you, play, do you take that gamble and short fill here to pick up track position, knowing that you'll have to stop one more time for sure? Well, obviously not for them, but for what somebody a great else. idea. Uh, that's why I'd rather be sitting up here than making those decisions <laughs> down there. You know, a while, right. a while ago, guys, uh, they were telling Max Pappas, and I think Scott touched on this, and he was getting 2.77 miles per gallon. That's outstanding. Big Kenny number. Breck, they were targeting 2.75 in the hopes that maybe they could stretch it so there would be a final stop. But it is still going to be a little dicey here as we play him out, approaching lap 200. Breck, Pappas, Jordan Jr., the top three. Jordan Jr. is coming in from third place. Jan Vegas. And they have had routine stops all day. And that's all they need here. No drama. Right in front of them, Mauricio Guzman is pitting, meaning when he leaves, he'll have to swing a bit wide. Turn a little front wing, just a little bit. Okay, that was one turn of front wing. 12.1, and he beats Mauricio out. Elio Castroneves was also in and out. You love that hot pepper on the nose of Jordan's car. You can hear him say, just a little bit of front wing. This is where you want to get the car trimmed out just as much as you can stand. You certainly don't want any understeer. You want it neutral, even a little bit loose, so you can stay on the throttle all the way through the corners. You can't afford to have to lift at the exit with push. We talk about these guys coming in and taking a full load of fuel. Even though it's a 12-second stop, when you come in, it seems like it takes forever to get that fuel in the car. You hear these guys get real anxious. They get it up on the throttle almost a little too soon and just hold it there on the rev limiter. And they may think that's supposed to be doing, but I'm telling you, after you're going out there running that hard, that fast for so long, when you come in and make this that pit stop, it seems like it takes an eternity to get that full load of fuel on board. In regards to the pit stop for Jordan, after the pit stop, I asked the crew, was that your last stop? They said, no, we will have to stop again. Yeah, I'm thinking anybody that stops now, now if they can get seven, eight more laps and then stop, then maybe they'll go to the end. Well, here's a driver that had a horrible day in the beginning of the race, but now Cristiano Damata has managed to climb up into fourth place. We've just heard that he needs to target 2.74. There you can hear him lifting off the throttle past start finish. This is a race right oh, now. Chris L2. Did you see that? Yeah, but this is a race right now that these guys don't want to lead. You can hear Cristiano lift, and the only reason you do that so early in the middle of the straightaway, you're just going for mileage, trying to figure out what you need from the car on this last round of stops. Because on that quick fuel at the end, if it stays green, you won't have time to make any stops. 
so that you can just sprint the last 50 laps of this race. And Parker, if you think about Damata, with his air jacks not working, no way are they going to try and change tires. Kenny Breck out of the lead on the pit road. 2.7. 2.7, that's going to give you about 47 laps at speed. Here comes the nose of the car, Paul. They were targeting that 275. I don't think they got there because they've still got 48 laps to go, according to my quick calculations. Wing change up front. And there come the revs again, waiting to get all the fuel. 12.8 seconds. A little hesitation as he engaged the clutch, but he got it going all right. You got a glimpse at the end of Scott Remke. He's the voice on the radio here. Here comes Mac Pappas out of the lead. Gary? Neil's got your drink bottle. Nice. Sliding over a pit stall. We get a good look here now as Max comes in here. Boy, remember the heartbreak of 99 for this guy. He knows that he's in a great position today. He can get the good service here, get the good mileage. He'll have a lap advantage or so on his teammate. Another good stop. 12.6, and Mark Johnson reminds him to watch the speed. Cristiano D'Amata makes his stop. Came in from third. Look for Timmy and hits the bars. Again, they, they don't have the pneumatic jack on the front of the car working, so they have to do it manually. Boy, they've gotten well, good at it, though. Oh. Now they're going to have to bring it up again because that left front still isn't Wait, done. Wait, lift the front up, get the stud on here. Front up, get the stud on here. Uh. And here is Junkera. The only way you're going to get your lap back is by overtaking yeah. everybody now. We're all going to the end, just about. We're listening to the radio with you. <laughs> There's no question that there's enough revs to break the tires loose on that one. Okay, watch your wheels at the exit. Don't put any wheels over. So frustrating for the driver. You can drive a brilliant race and have it all go wrong in the pits. We're getting awful close to where those stops might take us to the end. Battle is at the front. Michelle Jordan Jr. has taken over the lead from Dario Franchitti. That's great. Further back, Gidley, Carpentier battle. That battle is for six. So now we're in that final hundred miles they say that they will wait for before they race. This Toyota Spotlight takes a look at Tony Kanaan, former winner here. Remember that battle in 99 with Max Pappas? Pappas running out of fuel and Kanan screaming for the line and taking the win. Today has not been nearly as good. In and out of the pits constantly with a battery going dead on him because the alternator was gone and finally the car officially retired. The guy that he battled with though, Max Pappas running in second place behind his teammate and pole sitter, Kenny Breck. But Jan Vikas, Max Gidley, has, or Memo Gidley has a problem? Yeah, amazingly, they pulled the lid off the car and added oil. I have not seen that for a while. Now they're going to put some fuel in the car, fire them back up, and get them underway. So that is one of the things that unknown for a 500-mile race. It's interestingly enough that these 500-mile races, some of the cars have actually carried onboard oil tanks. I've, I've been there, I've done it in the past, where getting down towards the end, you'll actually turn the oil pump on and put a quart or two in it. To do it manually is a little bit of a change, but we've had the option to do that from the car, from the cockpit in years gone by. Oh, and you remember when it, uh, when it used to be illegal? Remember Parnelli Jones at the Indy 500 and the big argument with uh, J.C. Agajanian and the Chief Steward Harlan Fengler out on the line? Well, Toyota was the first manufacturer to do that, to use a, res a reserve oil tank that you could pump during the course of the race. The reason for that is these engines are run very loose internally to try to reduce internal engine friction to get as much horsepower as possible. They burn a lot of oil, and therefore, with that consumption, they need to be able to transfer more into the dry sump during the event. Frank is back to the lead again. 
In second place is Kenny Brack. Now, you know we normally try and show you the, uh, the scoring in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. Well, it's not just the computers and batteries on race cars that suffer from the heat. We've got a little bit of a problem with the computer that generates that. I can assure you the scoring we're telling you is coming directly from CART and therefore accurate. We're going to try and get it fixed, and we apologize that it's not there. You know, we haven't talked at all today about Firestone and the tires. Even though as hot as it is today, I had a chance to talk to a couple of the Firestone representatives. They said tires are not a problem. Remember, we've been running around here 230, 240 miles an hour. Today, we're not running those speeds. So today, tires are not a problem whatsoever. Frankiti, Breck, Pappas, Gary Gerald. Interesting conversation a few moments ago. We saw Scott Remke leave his scoring stand, come over to talk to Mark Johnson. Johnson on the radio to Mac Pappas. Remke on the radio to Kenny Breck. They've been two major players all day long. The conversation then on the radio to Kenny Breck said, you have to get 2.8 miles per gallon and fall back to make it happen. He just said, do it. Meanwhile, Johnson told Max, do whatever you have to do, but you need to make 2.75 miles per gallon. So they're still going to have to stretch it a bunch to get home without a splash before the end. And Gary, I can tell you that if you do not have the draft, you make 2.1 miles per gallon. So oh. and now with the yellow, that, that changes everything. Yellow comes out. Christian Fittipaldi. Not a great day. First contact with the wall on the track. Remember, he brushed the wall. And he's coming out of there fast. Remember last year he dodged the bullet here as well, sliding down the back stretch, but he is limping. Well, he made heavy contact with the right side of the car up against the wall. Fire's a great motivator, though, to eject out of those cars quickly. Usually the safety crew doesn't want you out in case you have an injury and the adrenaline's just overpowering that pain and causing you to get out, but it looks like he's okay except for that limp. Happened up between three and four. Oh, I've been up there and it looked a lot like this and you don't know what caused it it could have been something as simple as a puncture debris some sort of simple failure it doesn't take much at these speeds to put you up against that wall hard you know you set yourself up there I know well I'm not oh I hope Christian's all right obviously it's a little more than normal they just want to have a good look at him to make sure he's okay well the race average of 185 and a half miles an hour is going to suffer a little now. Was beginning to approach the 189.7 set by Ellinger Jr. as the race record in 1990. And this is the yellow that they were looking for. Or do you want to go maybe half a turn on the on the right? Uh, they're coming down. in. See a little debris hanging up on the cowling there, right behind the uh, Kenny Breck Lego champ car, just behind the buckyard. This is over in turn two. That's Christian going by. Something on fire there. So I'm guessing the engine's starting to let go. Yeah, it happened coming off turn two, going down the back straight. And that's what I mean. There's so many things. Take half a turn off the right front. There's so many things. Okay, we'll take one half turn out of the right front. Beyond a driver's control here that can put him into the fence, cause many problems. That's why we're not quick to assign blame. Because Scott knows, I know, Jan knows. Something can happen, put you into the fence, and it's completely, completely beyond anything that you could have done about it, other than just some good prayer. Working the 217th lap, under caution, I assume everybody comes in, fills it, and sprints to the finish. Not necessarily. Yeah, I don't yeah. think so, Paul. <laughs> no, I, I, I think so, because you're not going to lose anything. You're going to come in, you're going to fuel up, you may you lose one or two positions as far as who you're running with, but you're not going to go lap it down. You may be well, at the end of the queue, but you'll be able to work your way back up to the front. Also get fresh tires. What do you think, Jan? I'm thinking that that track position might be very critical from what we've seen so far, that guys can work towards the front, but they may not be able to come all the way forward. Yeah, I think that if I could turn my fuel to the point, get 2.5 or better and make it, I would stay out. We asked about Michelle Jourdain moments ago. They are still in heavy discussions, and I think part of the discussion is how long will the yellow be? Exactly. That, that is the key because you generally get three times the mileage under yellow 
that you get under green. Hey, yeah. nobody asked me, but I'd love to see. <laughs> I'd okay, love to Gary. see half of them come in and half stay out, and we got a wild scramble to the end of this thing. And it's and it's going to be interesting because what's going to happen is it all depends on how good these cars are. If the driver is really satisfied with his car and the way it's handling, he'll probably stay out. If they aren't quite happy with it, feel like they can make a quick little change or two, they'll be in and make a pit stop, try and get that best car they can get to the checkered flag. And we heard Kenny Brick. Well, there may be the answer That's there. That's answer right there, guys. I yep. think. That's that's Kenny's estimate. He said ten laps. Now he's revised it to five laps. We More have yellow. We have one update, Parker. The tires are out for Michelle Jordan, Brian Herda. Looking down the road, Max Pappas. Yeah. So. And also Dario Franchini, Michael Andretti, and now Kenny Brick. Hey, Gary, that's a little more than half. Yeah. Isn't it, Gary? <laughs> And the reason that they have kept them out and the pits closed so long is they had to get Pappas and Franchitti to swap their positions because they wanted to get them back in proper order before they get the pits open. So now everybody waits. And the other thing that was interesting before the yellow came out is we really saw the teammates helping each other, the players' cars, the green cars. Before this incident with Fittipaldi, we were watching the Newman Haas cars. Everybody was using their teammates that may have been out of contention to try to pull them around. Pitch is open. I'm coming in. I don't. Yeah, pitch is open. Okay. Got to remember, only lead lap cars are going to make this pit stop. I'll be busy. Lead the way. Michelle Jourdain will be the first car to stop because he is more towards pit in. There goes Breck, Franchitti, Pappas. But in the meantime, we will see how Jourdain does in his service. Okay, reset the all. Gary? Kenny Breck in. Boy, on a hot day. This is when these pit crew guys are really going to make their money. There's the half turn in the front. There goes Breck. That's quick. Nine and a half seconds. There goes Pappas. Jourdain is in front of Pappas as they roll by. Up. Pack up. Michelle Jourdain Jr., though, he came out in great position as they exited the pit. Some fast stops. We should race to the finish. Well, here are the guys running up at the front. Michelle Jourdain Jr., Dario Franchitti. There's Mad Max Pappas. And, of course, the sweet Kenny Brett. We are still under the full course caution. Jordan Jr. picked up the best advantage on that last round of stops and sits in second place right now. 29 laps left. We're guessing seven or eight laps still in this caution period. So what about Michelle Jordan Jr.? Great drive. It has been a great drive. The man who gives him the car from the engineering standpoint is Tom Brown. Tom, you're in second. You gain on that pit stop. I assume you have plenty of fuel now. Has the car got it to win? Yeah, we've got all the fuel we need, and uh, the car's been right under the mall race. It's just one turn here, one turn there. It's all a matter of just uh, racing now. He's having fun out there. Have you been holding back? It's now the, the time you say, let's get it in the right gear and go for it? Well, that's for sure. We've been not cruising, but we're just trying to stay there. Now we're going to turn it up and go for it. Well, this ought to be very, very interesting. Tom Brown, of course, has a long history with the Penske team. Harry? Scott Remke, how much indecision was there leading up to what now appears to be a great decision? Well, it looked like there was a lot of it. We were going to stop the whole time. We were just second-guessing ourselves a little bit. But then you look up, there's only four or five cars in the lead lap. And we've had the strongest horse in town all week, so we want to give them the fuel and tires and go. Of course, everybody talks about reliability for 500 miles. 30 laps are just under to go. What are your concerns? Well, we'll just see if it lasts or not. Okay. Waiting for that what could be a sudden onset. Right now, Kenny Breck is looking pretty good. There's the full field summary at this moment. Breck, Jordan Jr., and Mac Pappas. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. Kenny Breck and his performance on ovals. Remember, he is a former Indy 500 champion. And then this year at the Twin Ring Motegi in Japan and at Milwaukee, he was able to take the win. He understands 
Now to race the oval. Right now, he is the leader of the field. 223 laps are complete. Look at that, 963 laps led on ovals. That's combining his heart and his IRL stats. We should be going green here shortly. It should be a sprint for 25 laps to the finish. If you missed this morning's British Open, remember four tied for the lead as they started the final round of play. David Duval ended up as the champion. The British Open will have highlights immediately after the run here at Michigan. Interesting difference in coaching between the two team Ray Hall cars. Scott Rimke's telling Kenny Brick, look, the guys put you out front out of the pits. Just go full rich, it's all up to you. Max Johnson, coaching Max Pappas said, we're gonna be smart, we're not gonna be greedy. Use your head, do what you need to. Actually, so one telling them to go, the other one saying, don't go too much too soon. Actually, that's Mark Johnson. Oh, what did I say, Mike Johnson? Mac Johnson. Oh, Max Johnson. One of the Johnson brothers. brothers. Christian, <laughs> I, I just got done talking to uh, Newman Haas. He said, Christian's fine. He said he's actually limping because he was pushing the throttle down for so long. His foot went to sleep and he was limping around a little bit. Kind of like Tony Stewart at the Indy 500 this year. There have been 131 unofficial lead changes. Nine different leaders, 45 lead changes at the line, and here we go. This could be the sprint to the finish. Pappas looks high on Michelle Jourdain Jr. Jr. goes into the lead. Michelle Jourdain Jr. goes into the lead. Pappas goes into second place. Well, was that on purpose, or did they just get better momentum on Kenny Brack as they came back? He got stuck on both sides. That's called the draft, Paul. They just got a great run on him, a great tow. Split him and off they went. Now these three drivers obviously are trying to get a breakaway from Frank Kitty and the rest of the group a little bit further and they'll have it. Michelle comes around Max Pappas and he has the lead. Here comes Kenny Breck back. Fourth is Brian Herta, fifth is Dario Frank Kitty. Patrick Carpentier is having a great day running in six. These guys are all trying to figure out where do they want to be come that white flag. They're trying to figure out what the best position is. Max got back just a little bit there. He's going to be coming back. But as you can see, it doesn't take long before you can catch right back up. There goes Michelle Jourdain, Max on the bottom. All of these are Lola's and all of these are Ford Power. And the strategy is what, is what we saw played out last year with Montoya and Andretti in the last 20 laps of trying to figure out exactly where you need to be on that last lap. Do you want to be second going into the first corner to draft by on the back straightaway, or do you want to hold back like Scott did on Alan Jr. and wait until the very last corner and just hope that you've got enough time to make it to the start-finish line? This is going to be a tough one to call because as these guys get in the closing laps of this race, they're going to have to make that decision where they want to try and be. As you saw, the sales are dang. Just pass them right there at the line. Not quite enough to pull off the uh, to lead that lap, but these guys are going back and forth, back and forth, trying to figure out where they want to be at the right time. And Frank Keeney faded a bit on the last lap. Brian Hurt has come up to fourth, Carpentier to fifth. Frank Keeney dropped to sixth. And least we forget, Cristiano D'Amata has stayed with it today. He's back on the lead lap and running seven. Even with the problems they've had in the pits, having to manually jack the car, he's still there. He's now five seconds behind. But Brian Hurt has managed to pick up this draft he and his engineer, Lee Dykstra, one of the things they wanted to prove to everyone is not only is Brian a great road course driver, but he's also very good on the ovals. They've just had horrible luck this season. And now look at Carpentier up there. And Pappas comes back around. Jordan Jr. Herta battles with Carpentier. Carpentier, the first to announce he is signed with players racing for next year. This begins the... Who was that up high? That was Frank Keedy. This now begins the official... 20 to go, 20 to go. Just think where you want to be. This begins the official silly season, so these guys are not only driving for a 500-mile win, but a lot of them are beginning their negotiations for next year, trying to get the best deal, the best ride, or a ride at all. So some of these guys a little more desperate than you might normally see. And that's why we call it silly season. Jordan Jr. and Pappas go side by side. What a great run for Michel Jourdain Jr. He's been in the thick of things all day long, especially the latter half of this race. 
and he's showing some real speed and some real power here. Oh, Kenny, and there goes Herta. Herta goes by on the inside and takes the lead. He came out of nowhere, came out of that battle with Carpentier, and just flew into the lead. Herta very quietly working in this lead pack all day long. Another very mature, very experienced, very smart race car driver has been saving himself and his car, and now he's having a bit of a test to see what it might look like at the very end. And that's what they're doing is just having a go to see to see how strong they are when they get down in the last few laps. They want to know what kind of car they've got underneath them. And now look at Kenny on the high side of Carpentier. Carpentier and Kenny Breck go side by side. With the exception of that red target car, everything else there is for position. And her now again. Whoa, 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 whoa! Oh, no! The teammates touch! Breck hard into the wall! Pappas' car destroyed, too. Yellow flag is out. Team Rahal so dominant, most of the year, certainly here and all through the weekend, we saw Brian Herta come up high, they crossed the wake, there was no place for them to go, Max's car washed up high, Herta didn't keep the car down low, coming off the corner, he used the road on the way up, I was surprised when I saw it happen, it's impossible to hang on the car when you lose the downforce from the under tray of the car, and unfortunately it took out these two teammates who have run so strongly. Let's look at it again. Now watch Brian Herta, the lead car. He's down low as they come off the corner. Brian Herta now, the lead car. You can see him cross up high. Max washes up high. He can't hold the, the middle line. Kenny holding position in clean air on the high side. Nothing he could do results in contact. Takes out both of the Ray Hall Letterman cars. Hugely disappointed. These guys have been so strong. Now watch Herta move up. Max starts to wash up high. He can't keep the car down. Makes contact with Kenny Breck. Brilliant driving there. Dario Franchitti missing him. Everyone else getting through cleanly. Parts everywhere. A wheel bouncing down the track. And thank goodness that Kenny Breck's car did stay pinned to the wall for a while. Oh, that was close for Pappas, though. Oh, and a big hit on that unprotected wall on the inside. Damata almost once again involved. Just being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he snuck through that time. You can see the half shaft spinning, spinning out, the wheel bouncing down the track, debris everywhere. Now watch here, high, Herta slides up high, Max then goes up high into Kenny. They touch, Carpentier Whoa. makes it through, Frank Kitty just makes it through, Jordan goes, oh man! Junkera makes it through, now watch Cristiano Damata as he comes through, he just goes out of the picture there. Hundred and thirty-two perfect laps out of those two guys. They're both fine, but my goodness, just that split second, that tiny mistake. Kenny Breck and his teammate Max Pappas are both being reported all right. They're obviously walking. This is Junkera. I think his heart started again. Let's go down to Jan Vegas. With Michael Andretti, who of course left the race with engine trouble, but you had another problem. Water bottle problems, what was up with that? Yeah, my water bottle broke, so I was a little dehydrated there. It took, uh, took a couple minutes to get some uh, water back in me, but uh, I'm okay. Thankfully, Michael is okay. Thankfully, the guys in the track are okay. But guys, he said he was really, really lightheaded and had trouble getting back here. Between Max Pappas and Kenny Breck, they combined to lead 147 laps today. A tiny mistake on 232 ended it for both of them. This is again the way it looked from Kenny Breck as they went into turn three. We'll be right back. Back at the Michigan 500 presented by Toyota. 
still up above, providing us with a blimp's eye view of the last exciting laps of today's race, the Fujifilm blimp of onboard cameraman Rich Steiner. And here is that touch once again. Now you could see Max was slowing down. He was in the turbulence trying to control the car. These cars are very much on the edge. Keep in mind, the Hanford device produces lift, not downforce. The front wings have to counterbalance that. It's only the underwing that's producing any downforce at all. If it gets turbulent air, the whole car starts to take off. Max and Kenny were very, very close together to begin with. Max moved just a little bit up in the wake. You can see him sliding back there as he doesn't have full control over the car. Not his fault, just a wake turbulence problem. It's a lot what you read about, about airplane crashes and wingtip vortices and the accidents you see sometimes at airports, except this is happening on the ground at 220 miles an hour. You cannot put into words how disappointed these guys are. I mean, even though we're going to go up and interview them and talk to them about the race, your heart has just been crushed. You feel it so close, and it just slips through your fingers that fast. I mean, that happened in less than a fraction of a second, and your day is done after running so good and so strong all day. Max Pappas almost saved that thing. There's the look down from the... Fujifilm blimp drifting over the track here. We're probably going to have about seven or eight laps when we come back to the green flag. Sprint to the finish with Brian Herta, Carpentier, Franchitti, Jordan Jr., and Damata. They're the front of the field. Unbelievable chain of events in a single accident. We mentioned it starting. How unpredictable this race can be, and it's done it again. At the Michigan 500, presented by Toyota, this is Paul Page with Parker Johnstone. Scott Pruitt, Gary Gerald, Jan Bikas down in the pits. It's all going to come down to the final 20 miles, the final 10 laps. They will have the green next time by, and how they build momentum here on the backstretch. And when Brian Herta decides to finally nail that throttle, it is going to make all the difference in the world. We've got the battles of the drivers. We've got Renards and Lolas. We've got Fords. A Honda, Toyota's all represented. It's a shootout on every single front for those last 10 laps. And when you consider the names up there at the front, Herta, Carpentier, Franchitti, Jourdain, oh, it's going to be good. Herta nails the throttle, advances the line, pulls away, the green flag comes out. They give her to the green flag, and he gets an enormous jump on everybody else. But that's not going to last. Watch the draft as Carpentier comes for Jourdain, working with Franchitti here. As Parker said, that's only going to last about a lap or two before they get hooked up and pull right back up to Herta. And this is where the end game begins, so to speak. They've got to figure out where they want to be in the closing lap in order to take advantage of the draft. These guys now using maximum revs, maximum advance on the ignition. Let's go to Jan Bikas. Max Pappas has been released from the medical center. Max, what happened? You know, the Miller 4 car today was a car to beat, you know, I was very happy, I was just there waiting, you know, I was in the right spot. And uh, my disappointment is tremendous. I had them, everybody covered, and uh, I want to watch the video. Are you and Kenny okay? I am okay, I'm uh, pretty hurt inside, but uh, I'm very disappointed for Team Ray, all my mechanics, all the shell mechanics. But, uh, you know, I want to watch the video. He wants to see the tape before he commits himself, guys. Carpentier took the lead for the moment. Herta is back in the lead. Here comes Carpentier. Franchitti tucks in. They go three wide at the line. Oh, I love this place. Look at this. Three abreast, four with Jordan in there. Cristiano D'Amato working his way up. The last car on the lead lap. It looks like a pace lap at 220 miles an hour. And this is what Michigan's all about. You talk about close racing. This is the essence of it right here. Michel Jourdain back to the lead. Oh, Unbelievable. Fantastic. Side by side, wheel to wheel racing. Guys, does this bring back memories of some of the earlier races when you had the underdogs, guys like Jose Lee Garza, Pancho Carter, John Paul Jr. battling for a lead at Michigan? That's exactly what it's been since 1981. And to think that this is the last race for Carter's no 500 scheduled here for next year. Maybe that'll get corrected. Here comes Franchitti. Franchitti to the lead. Dario has never won on an oval, let alone a 500-mile race. And he said, look, I'm tired of this. I know I can win on all of these circuits. 
He and his engineer, Ian Watt, working very closely all year long, but he's got a few guys that want to dispute whether he's going to win or whether they will. But Brian Herta was right down on the flat as they came across there. Start watching. Who's good up high? What? Oh, don't count out Cristiano D'Amata. He's still got his nose in there. 156 unofficial lead changes. You saw the 50 at the line. Nine different leaders. Carpati, a couple of interesting... A couple of interesting radio conversations. He said, I don't have a car to lead, but I have a car to win. They're telling him to stay second until turn two of the last lap. So that's the strategical information from his pits, but only Patrick knows what's best on the track. If, if you can do it, you want to take the lead going into three. Let the car slide up in front of the guy behind you. <laughs> <laughs> take that's a little air off his nose and go onto the checkered flag. Ten miles to go, less than that now. You ride with Cristiano DeMonta. And he's not going to lift this time through start finish, but he had to there as he got boxed in on the high side of one. Remember, their crew has struggled with a car that doesn't have all of its jacking system working throughout the day. So his stops have been a little longer. Consider that when we see the margin of victory here in four laps. The Newman Haas boys stayed after it all day long. It's paid off now with Cristiano fourth that time past the line. Falling back a little bit, but he very much is in this with now just three laps to go. There you go as they cross the line. They go three wide again. Carpentier comes down inside. As these two lead cars run side by side, that leaves a bigger hole for the guy back in third. That's why we're seeing these guys back in third, fourth position make big jumps up to the lead. Well, we've seen it look so far like Jordan and Frankini have had the strongest cars, but Hertas seems to have been okay to run where he is, but he's got to get up there now if he wants to fight for the win here. Carpante and Frankini can effectively... Oh, there goes Jordan. We talked about that big hole those two cars lead. Now Jordan just slips right through where they're running side by side, leaves a big hole, and they just slip right up to the lead. Now the key is where do I want to place myself for this final lap? Probably not the lead. And the problem Hurt has got, he's now got Tracy and Tagliani keeping him from this lead group. I think he's fallen out of it. He's too far back. Just remember, they're going to be able to draft past you, so let them have it. Where do you want to be, Paul? What's um, the answer to the biggest question of the 500 miler? I'm thinking right now, I want to be in second. Tagliani's going to figure into this finish as he runs up there with everybody else. Last lap. Oh! Last lap. They touched! Oh, that one was close. So Tagliani comes up there. Oh! Whoa, 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 Man, Jardine almost slid up into Frankini now. But it's it, the two teammates helping each other. And it may be Carpentier looking for his first ever win. Carpentier at the line. Patrick Carpentier takes his first victory. Wow, that was awesome. Oh, that's the way to do it, Patrick. The French Canadian with an incredible victory by 24 one hundredths of a second. His 79th start. I'm going to celebrate. Nice job. They have run the last lap of the Michigan 500. Oh, no. And with his teammate figuring into the deal, here it was, Parker. Cross the line with one to go. Jordan slow, but now look, we've got the spoilers in Tracy and Tagliani. You're thinking, okay, we've got Frankini, Patrick's there, Jordan's trying to make his way back up. He cuts down very aggressively here. Tries him again on the low side, can't get it done, starts to slide up high into Frankini. Frankini's got to lift off because of the turbulence. The two players' teammates say, wow, this works out quite well. Carpaggi says, finally, I've got to win. I re-signed for next year, the earliest I've ever known in my racing history as to what I'm going to do the following year. He rewards the team with a 500-mile victory at Michigan. Here you watch specifically Tagliani. 
There's Carpentier as he moves high. Jordan Jr. almost bumps wheels. And now it belongs to Carpentier. There's no way they're going to take it away from him. There's Michel Jordan Jr. He has every right to be happy as well. But the second place finish, Frank Heaney third, DeMonta fourth, Brian Hurd a fifth. And being with a small team, having experienced this very, very same opportunity, finishing second is as good as a win when you're up against massive, large teams. The kind of race he had all day long was absolutely brilliant. Second place, fantastic from Rochelle Jardin. Now they're showing him down in third, tied at the line with Dario Franchitti, 0.243 seconds behind Carpaccia at the line. Yeah, they're gonna have a couple of things to resolve here. The official scoring monitor is showing Carpentier as the winner by 0.243 over both Franchitti and Jordan Jr. They just flip-flopped those results with Franchitti now second, Jordan third. Cristiano DeMata fourth, Brian Herta fifth. And Tagliani, of course, running with the leaders at the finish. A lap down in sixth place. And remember, Cristiano DeMata had slid all the way to the very back, struggled with the faulty air jack system. The Newman Haas crew performing great pit stops, even though they had those problems. Cristiano fighting his way back to fourth. Start looking at the championship implications here. Franchitti moving up. Cristiano DeMata moving up. Gary Gerald. Uh, pandemonium at Victory Circle. Isn't that the way you want it? After all these years of running in this speedway, the final chapter in immediate kart racing history goes to Patrick Carpentier. The emotion of this team and this crew, unbelievable. 500 grueling miles as soon as Patrick gets that helmet and the Hans device out of the way. Being assisted here will get his first thoughts on his first champ car victory. Boy, through the years, we've seen so many great moments with some of those names that we mentioned just a short time ago. Here comes Patrick out. Pat, it's... <laughs> Here comes Neil Mickelwright, team manager. A man who just re-signed, picked up the option for next year. Pat, let's talk a little bit about these final laps here now. How concerned were you? What was going through your mind? Because it just, there was no room for any error. Jerry Forsythe, that's congratulations. <laughs> yeah, there was none. You know, I, I was trying to be behind for the last couple of laps, but not too far behind. And I was trying to time it. And first when I saw a tag coming, I said, oh man, what is he doing? And he got in front of me, gave me a toe, and it was... Was that step. the key? Well, he helped me, because I think if it wouldn't have been there, I don't think I would have made it. So, uh, fantastic. Thanks, Doug. Were you thinking you might have to back out and try to reposition yourself on the last lap before you saw your teammate? Yeah, I was, uh, I was a bit worried, because I knew Dario was really strong, and I said, man, he's waiting to get a, a shot at me at the end like he did in Detroit. But uh, I came along, and everything uh, worked out fine. The car was perfect. We had problems at the beginning. We didn't quit. And the team was fantastic. How does it feel to get number one under your belt, considering all the hardships and broken bones along the way? Hey, it's been tough. Just happy. And you've got a brand new contract for next year, too. A lot of things to celebrate, my young friend. Thank you. The emotion and the tears come to his eyes. And here comes the Harris 500, presented by Toyota Trophy, to Patrick Carpentier and the players team. Uh, he doesn't care about that. He cares about his team. There's the battle for second. The line on the left is the official finish line here. That close enough for you? Franchini by an inch. And the unofficial results of the Michigan 500 presented by Toyota. Carpentier with a great drive up through the field. Franchitti, another good drive. And Jordan Jr. in third. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. We have mentioned close finishes in our Toyota spotlight. Let's take you back to 1995 when Scott Pruitt edged out Allinger Jr. 99, Pappas out of fuel. Canon goes on to take the win. Last year, Montoya and Michael Andretti. That's an enormous finish. Why are you calling that close? 
today by .243. Patrick Carpentier finishes for the first time in front, the winner of the Michigan 500. Let's go to Jan. And with some huge celebrations when you got out of the car, a podium finish, your first. Tell us about the last lap. Oh, it was great. I first have to thank everybody, you know. I heard this with the house and everybody knows this for all these years, you know, they have supported me and this is an amazing moment. This for Tony, Shirley, Larry and Ross, you know, we miss them a lot, but Tony built this team and thanks to him everything is here. I mean, I want to say hi to all my family, everybody that supported me through all these years. Los quiero mucho, un beso y gracias. All right, but, but tell me about the last lap. You, well, I thought I could get into, if I could get into three in leading, I could maintain it, you know by keeping Dario out of the way, but Alex, who had not been there all, the, all these 10 laps, he never was in the way, and suddenly he came in the inside, I had to lift, I, I thought I was going with Dario, I mean, I, my right front was in front of his left rear, and we almost touched, and I think he beat me by nothing, I thought I had beat him, but it's okay. Well, it doesn't get any closer than that. Congratulations. Gary? Well, here's the other man in that uh, photo for the second place, Dario Franchitti. When you come down in a situation like that, do you have even an opportunity to think, or what's it like? I'd be planning it. <laughs> There's Michelle. Good job. Third time. Third time. I uh, did we plan it. Well, I was, Michelle and I were circulating together, and I was thinking this is, this is quite good because I was passing him every time just before the start-finish line. But uh, in the last lap, the players, guys, they, uh, they went either side of me, and Tag got in front of me. And I got into the, the bad air there. I had to back off a little bit. And uh, after that, it was Pat's race. But um, no, it was it was a clean race today. I think if Pat, if uh, Tag hadn't showed up, then uh, I think it might have been our day. But it's about time that Pat won a race. He's been driving really well and uh, good good race all day. Um, on the guys did a great job with the engine and Team Cole Green, great pit stops. And uh, hey, from 25th position to get up here on the podium and almost win it, that's a pretty good day, isn't it? Yeah, last to second. That it's almost almost as good as Cleveland. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. There it is once again, the uh, interval second to third between Franchitti and Jordan Jr., just two tenths behind the leader of the race. So in the Kart FedEx Championship Series, as we look at the points now, Kenny Breck is still hanging on, but Dario Franchitti makes an enormous jump up into second place. And we've seen our third first-time winner this season. We'll be back. Well, here are the unofficial results. They'll be official very shortly with Patrick Carpentier being the man on top after 167 different lead changes. And officially, they had 10 lead changes, or 10 different leaders for 54 changes at the line. Next week, it's across Lake Michigan, over to the windy city of Chicago. Qualifying comes your way Saturday evening on ESPN2. Card today, 11 o'clock Eastern, Sunday morning on 2. And then we'll have live coverage of the Target Grand Prix of Chicago next Sunday afternoon. Well, I think we promised and we delivered. It, uh, it always turns out to be an unusual race. Let's hope that sanity reigns here somewhere and eventually Cart finds their way back onto this track because it's pretty meaningful to them. Well, and it's meaningful to a lot of us. I'm worn out after another tremendous 500-mile race. Michigan always delivers. And look at the championship implications. Once again, we've had the whole top 10 jumbled. We've had seven of the top 10 championship positions change as a result of this race. I can't wait till next week in Chicago. And how about that Cristiano D'Amata, Jan? Yeah, it was an amazing drive. He's still trying to figure out how the heck he got back on the lead lap, but your crew did an amazing job. Yeah, they had a really, really difficult day. Uh, we lost the air jack on the first pit stop. So from the first pit stop, including the first pit stop to the end, we always had the quick jack pit stop. And instead of losing a lap in a half, usually uh, we, that's why we lose when we, uh, we, we make a green pit stop, we're losing like uh, two laps. So there was one point I asked on the radio, they told me I was two laps back, and at the end, they said, oh, you're going to pass around because we didn't pit on the last yellow. You're going to have to save a little bit of fuel, but you're going to be in the lead lap. And he did it, folks. He brought it in in fourth place. Awesome job. Cristiano D'Amata. Here were the crashes today, and the good news is that it's all no injuries. 
as a result of a fairly safe run of the Michigan 500. They're going to ice down Kenny Breck, who not surprisingly has some bruises after that impact with the wall. Now it's the third time in the last four years that Jerry Forsyth, as an owner, has won the Michigan 500. Here's our final Toyota spotlight for the day after a, a most memorable and eventful run at Michigan International Speedway. I'm Paul Page for Parker Johnstone, Jan Bikas, Scott Pruitt, and Gary Gerald. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week in Chicago. British Open highlights coming up next. ABC Sports online at ESPN.com. Keyword ABC Sports. This is ABC Sports, continuing the tradition of excellence.